That's it. Bring it. Bring it. One of these times, I'm just going to bask in all of your applause and then just leave. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are we doing? Good. Excellent. Today's the big day. In the beginning, there were thousands, thousands of students from all over the world, from our 65 university partners on six continents. On Friday, we arrived in Oxford, and there were hundreds, 40 teams. Uh, representing their institutions from around the world, and today there are six. Six finalist teams who are going to be pitching for the 2022 Map the System Global Prize. Welcome to everyone joining us uh, from around the world virtually. Um, uh, many of our Map the System uh, uh, partners, students, uh, and friends, as well as friends of the School Center and map the system from all over the world. Thanks for being with us. Those of you who are watching this later, thank you also for being with us. Um, this is a really exciting uh, day. We've had a wonderful weekend. Um, we've all learned a lot. We've met folks from all over the world. We've learned about problems we never really even thought about before. Um, we've made lifelong friendships, and we've learned some new things about each other. For example, coming into this weekend, we knew that we're blessed to have amazing teachers and educators at all of our institutions who have supported us all the way through. What we didn't know is that some of them are excellent dancers. <laughs> and you know who you are. <laughs> Would you like to demonstrate? No. <laughs> all right, shout out Vanderbilt. Um, so, so we're here because we believe that systems thinking is a superpower. We know there's lots of business plan competitions out there. There's lots of great entrepreneurial activities everywhere. But a lot of them, we think, fall short. And they fall short because um, we're all hardwired to want to fix problems and to jump to solutions. But the problem is, as any doctor will tell you, if you don't get the diagnosis right, your prescription is not going to work. And so Map the System is different because it asks us to take a step back and look at the problem in new ways. And by looking at the entire system, we can see things that others don't see, some of the unintended consequences of well-intended action, but also opportunities for change, for deep transformational change that maybe others don't see. And that's why systems thinking gives you an edge uh, and really gives us a, a platform for addressing the big grand challenges that we face in the 21st century. So that's what this is about. This is a a competition disguised as a learning program and a learning journey, and we're grateful to all of you uh, for being a part of this. Now, in today's final, you'll see that the pitches are going to be different from what you may have seen in a traditional business plan competition, because we really focus a lot more on understanding the problem and elucidating the key insights of what's holding the status quo in place and where there are leverage points for change. And the, the judges, who you'll meet in a few minutes, um, have taken a lot of time to understand the incredibly rigorous work that every Map the System team has done um, and are going to be scoring based on the understanding of the problem, the way one is able to visualize the system through systems maps, and then identify where are those places in the system where a little change can make a big difference, and proposing their ideas for a first step forward. So that's what it's all about. We have six amazing teams uh, today, and we're going to hear from them in a moment. Uh, but first, I just want to thank uh, uh, our friends at the Skoll Foundation, at the McConnell Foundation and Recode, at the Trico Foundation, as well as uh, all of the 65 universities who have been part of Map the System for all of your support this year. We couldn't do it without you. Um, we also want to thank our friends, of course, here at Site Business School and the University of Oxford for allowing us to do all this fun stuff that we get to do together. Um, so thank you to all of you. Maybe a big round of applause. And at this time, I'm pleased to introduce my co-host um, for the day, who's going to walk us through the program for the day and uh, keep me on time and in check, two things I'm not very good at, uh, Bronwyn Dugtig. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So I am going to do that. But before I do that, um, I have the great 
honour of introducing Faith Mwangi Pal as well as our first speaker for today and our keynote. Um, so many of you have spent months exploring complex and interconnected problems, um, and we thought we would open with a keynote address that shows an example of just this. Uh, a few months ago, I went to a TEDx Women London event, and I saw Faith speaking there about the interconnections between climate change and child marriage. Two things that I'd never thought about before, and it really demonstrated systems thinking to me, and examples of complex problems and how they interconnect. So Faith is the Chief Executive Officer at Girls Not Brides, Not Brides a broader movement to end child marriage. Before joining Girls Not Brides, Faith served as the Global Director for the Girl Generation, an initiative working to galvanize the African-led movement to end female genital mutilation and cutting. Faith is a public health expert with more than 20 years experience in leading, managing and implementing complex public health programs across Africa. Faith also donated her time to us yesterday and has been a key judge in the Map the System process. So Faith, welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning and thank you so much for the introduction. I always get embarrassed when I'm introduced. I don't know why, I should just be so <laughs> proud. Yeah, but before I start, uh, today is Father's Day. So if there are any fathers in the room, happy Father's Day. And this is the time. <clears throat> this is a time perhaps to send a text to your dad. <laughs> and if, and if, if you are dads and you don't receive a text, maybe you need to do some map the system. <laughs> What's happening right there? So I'm so delighted to be here. And first of all, I want to say thank you to the SCORE Center, to Lydia for inviting me here, to Alice, all the colleagues, to Oxford University, Said Business School, and to all of you, the students, who really put in so much hard work. I came here as a judge, but I live here as somebody who is so educated. I learned so much yesterday. I learned things I didn't even know I didn't know. So that is how deep it went. I was amazed. I learned about places I didn't even know exist. So I was so, so impressed, and I know we have six today, but I want to congratulate all of you who put in the effort, because in my eyes, you are all winners. It's so amazing to think about that. But I think what is so amazing, it gave me hope. Because from where I sit, and looking at the world I see, it's very easy to be hopeless. Looking at the, how the world has changed around even recently, looking at the things we are struggling with right now, cost of living, climate change, name it. There's so many things going on right now. Women violence, even in the streets of the UK, developed world, even in the streets all over the world, women are the heart of some of these challenges. Sometimes it's hard to wake up with hope, but when you listen to people like you, and I'll call you young, because many of you are younger than me, so I have the right to call you young. <laughs> so when I listen to young people coming with solutions of how we can change the social injustices happening all over the world, that gives me hope. And you know why it gives me hope? Because today, my job is to do exactly what you have been doing, is to map why child marriage is happening across the world. Why 23 girls are getting married every minute at the age of 13, at the age of 12, at the age of 15. Why is that still going on in this century? That is the question I wake up every day trying to address and also thinking, what can I do about it? Myself, in my own capacity as a woman, as a girl who grew up in a village in Kenya, wore my first shoes when I was 14. Was very privileged to be able to go to school when my neighbors in a class of 33 girls, two of us went to high school. What happened then? What made it that possible for me to go to school? Can we replicate that in a larger scale globally? That is the question I ask myself every day. 
I'm a mother of a boy, one boy. Jake, he just finished university and he impresses just like he impresses me like you impressed me yesterday. Because young people are really the hope for the future. But let me tell you a little bit about child marriage and what I do. I'm the CEO of Girls Not Brides. Girls Not Brides is a global partnership. We have over 1,600 civil society organizations working in over 104 countries. All of us united with a vision that a world where boys are equal to girls, where girls are valued as boys, is possible. Where girls can choose who, when, and if they want to get married. We believe every day, all of us, 1,600 organizations and all the people there, millions of us, we wake up every day believing that that world is possible and trying to do what we can do to make that world happen. In February, just before the lockdown of 2020, I was so privileged to visit India. We have great members in India who are working with us and have not been able to go and see any of our members because of the lockdown, so I define myself as a as a COVID CEO, because I actually joined Girls Not Rise in 2019. I was living in Kenya. I moved in the UK at the end of September 2030. Ah, 2030, 20, 2019. I'm way ahead. <laughs> Slow down, woman. So, so I so I moved in, and then in, I went to India in in February of 2020. And then in March, we, went and we entered the lockdown. So the vivid story I have in my mind about child marriage is my story of India. But there are many stories. But I like telling the story of India because it's so real, it's so authentic. I lived it, I was there, I talked to the people, I touched them, I gave them a hug. So that story is in my bones. And I met these little young girls. And they were talking about how they go home to home, talking to parents and persuading them to end child marriage. And as I sat with them, we walked out together. And I asked them, what motivates you to do that? And she said, because at the age of 12, I had been forced to get married. And I ran away. And I went back to my grandmother and my mother, and I persuaded them to allow me to go back to school. Because I only knew that was the reason. That was the only opportunity for me to get a different future. And she told me it was a tough conversation. But she's lucky that she managed to persuade the parent to allow her to go to school. And because of that, she met up with other girls and now they go home to home, talking to parents, pleading, begging on their knees, whatever needs to happen, persuading them not to allow their daughters to be married before at least they are 18. And that story stayed with me. As I stand here, I might talk to you maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I don't know. 15 minutes, let's say. It might not take that long, maybe an hour. By the time I finish speaking to you, if it's 15 minutes, 342 girls will be married below the age of 18. So think about that every day as you walk around. Right now, there's a girl getting married. Maybe at an 11 year old, he's getting married somewhere. Maybe getting married to a 40 year old, because that happens. Maybe getting married to a 50 year old, because that happened. Some of them are pledged to be wed when they are babies, so that by the time you are 10, you will know who your husband is. That is a challenge we are dealing with. And we did a lot of map system, uh, system mapping, as we call it, and developed a theory of change of how can we add this problem. Laws, we need laws in place so that we can have the age of marriage amended by the government. We can criminalize. We can also look at the social norms, which really underpin some of these issues. The cultural norms, which underpin these issues. We can look at access to education. We can look at gender, gender inequality. What is the value of girls in your own communities, in the communities of the world? Even right here in the UK, until maybe March, girls are allowed to be married at the age of 16. But now there's a law in parliament. I don't know whether it's passed. It started, we started the campaign quite a while ago, but now there's a law. I think it's the House of Commons or House of Lords. I get a bit confused right there. But there's a law being passed to really uplift the age of marriage. In the US, on Friday, I was involved in a panel with the Illinois Bar Association of Lawyers. And we were talking about uh, lifting the age of marriage in the US. 
because of uh, the thing now is about 60 states which have changed the law that you cannot get married below the age of 18. There are a lot of states to go. So this is a global issue. This is really a global issue. It's not a global, it's not an issue over there. It's an issue over here too. So we need to really think about it. And as I looked at that, but the, our theory of change now is also evolving because there are new challenges, COVID. COVID brought a big challenge because of lockdowns. Education is not, we call that there is no silver bullet for social issues, but education comes close. Because the beauty of education is that the longer student, girls stay in school, the longer they delay marriage. But with COVID, some schools were locked out for two years. In fact, in India, my country, call it my country because that's what I have the, they had the, the story in my heart. The schools were locked down for two years and many girls got lost in that process. Many girls got married. So our theory of change is, is changing, that we need to add child marriage in a COVID world. How does that look like? Climate change. And I know when you think about climate change, the headlines which come to your, to your mind is the forest fires. Please watch my TED talk. I'll try to tell you a little bit about that. The thing which come to your mind when you hear forest, climate change, you think hurricanes, you may think about drought, you may think about erupting volcanoes, you may think about all sorts of things. But what we don't think about is the people behind those headlines, is the girls behind those headlines. There are countries right now, because of climate change, are experiencing so much drought that to put food on the table, they are selling their girls. That's their source of income. I'll give you my daughter, you give me a dowry, or you give me a cow. Because that cow will give us milk and we can feed the rest of the children we have. So the, the girls have become commodities because of climate change. Climate change is destroying household livelihoods and poverty is number one driver of child marriage. So when, parents, when families are pushed at the edge, what choices do they have? What choices do they have? The other big issue is culture. People are so afraid. When our world is shrinking, when we have problems, when we are struggling, it's so easy to identify with what you know. Fear is a big driver. Isolation is a big driver because people hold on to their cultures, they hold on to their traditions, and it becomes a form of identity. We have a story on our website, a story of a young girl in Nepal. And the father was saying he wanted to marry her off at the age of 13. And the biggest reason he did not want to allow her to go to school, because he was afraid what would the neighbors say. He was afraid that he would not fit in. He was afraid that he would be sanctioned as a non-compliant socialist, if you like. Really? Really? So these are big social problems. But as I said, it gives me hope. I'm so hopeful because all of you, and I made some notes, but I can't read my handwriting, so I'll keep talking. <laughs> so, but it gives me so much hope when I listen to all of you, because while you can come and sit here and think this is a competition, you are solving the problems of the world. And I read your intro on the bio, Dr. Drobak, is that the right pronunciation? And you said, we are looking at genuine problems and genuine change makers. Don't let anybody take that away from you. We, I was talking to my colleague here, I've forgotten your name already, I've got a short memory, but I was talking to one of the judges here this morning, and I was telling her the problem, you live with so much excitement from college. Then you come into employment and you meet your CEO and she tells you, this is how we do things over here. You just joined us. You wait and run a few years. But don't let anybody take that away because the things you are talking about right here are the solutions for the, the problems we are dealing with right here on the other end. Please do not lose that. Please, if I can persuade you, don't look at it as a project. Look at it as something you can contribute to the world and be that change maker you have actually been designed to be, because this is so important. I sat there thinking, and I was telling my judge, fellow judge here that some of these things we pay 
big bucks for consultants to come and tell us. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my God, maybe I need to join this group and we can figure out things together because people come and just tell you and I'm sitting here and I left thinking, mm-hmm, I know now a, a thing or two. Those consultants are not going to lie to me anymore. <laughs> I'm educated now. You know? So, I can talk for long, but I know you have a long day. And I want to really just also go back to where I started, that the six of you who are here, just give it all your all. You've already done the first bit. So I want to just wish you all the best. And I saw, and that's something else I'm going to tell you. I saw some of you being very nervous. Can I tell you something? You are the only one who knows what you are talking about. <laughs> and maybe you are a teacher. And maybe you are, you are an educator. So don't panic. Don't be nervous. We actually don't know. We are like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> so so just, just be really confident because confidence is 10 marks, you know? No, just, just saying. So, but I think it's so important that you own it. You are here because you deserve to be here. You are not less than. And even if you are not among the sixth, you are a winner in my eyes. And, I'm, and I, so I said that before. So let me just conclude as I say that this, this day to me has also transformed me. I hope it has transformed you. Being here this weekend, as I took my train and I was getting frustrated because if you took a train like me, Friday was chaotic at Paddington and I was thinking, why did I agree to do this? I need to learn to say no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Those were the conversations which were happening in my mind. Maybe I need to call them and I say I can't come. Maybe I need to change my mind. I, I have an appointment on Sunday, the Sunday afternoon. Actually, that's a good reason. And I had so many things which I would have said for me not to be here. But I'm really so happy I stuck with it. I'm so happy I came because I go back feeling like I have joined a new group of allies. That is how I've gone back, thinking there are people who are trying to solve very similar problems to myself. And the beauty of our movement is that we are never alone. Maybe it's your dad saying you haven't turned the text. <laughs> Please do. Yeah. So, so the beauty of having people like you trying to figure out the problems of the world has helped me to feel hope. So I live here with hope. And I feel so, so privileged that I've been part of this conversation. I call it a conversation because it's been a conversation. So I feel changed, I feel transformed. And for you educators, educators, for you educators, you are doing a fabulous job. When young people are getting lost, especially now in the COVID world, there are so many young people really struggling, not knowing what to to do, not knowing where to turn. Mental health has become a challenge. For people to produce some of the things they have produced here, you should be ever so proud. And for my fellow judges, I'm so sorry for the fights we had yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> some of us were bruised a little bit, but we did a fabulous job. So thank you for giving your time and for being part of that whole conversation. And if you want to know a little bit about child marriage, please go to girlsnotbright.org. Thank you so much, and good luck. And enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. Thank you for your stories and your honesty, and thank you as well for the incredible work that you do to end child marriage across the world. So I thought we would just talk a little bit about um, what uh, today is going to entail um, and how we make that possible. So in order for today to be possible, as you know, it's a competition and we have some incredible judges um, that came to help us with the MAPA System Global Final. 
Um, unfortunately, we have a one judge, Samal Azal, that couldn't be here with us today. Um, he was joining us from Change Please, and he tested positive for COVID yesterday. So a shout out to uh, Samal. We are sorry you can't be here, and thank you so much for all your marking and your scoring, and we hope you feel better soon. I also wanted to take the opportunity to introduce our judges. We have Habida Mbatu, who is an inquiry manager at Lankelly Chase. Uh, which is a charity foundation that works to improve the quality of life of people who, survey, su who face severe multiple disadvantages. We have Dr. Kate Roll as well, um, who many of you um, enjoyed dancing with on the dance floor last night, I hear, who's an assistant professor and head of teaching at uh, UCL's Institute of Innovation and Public Purpose. Uh, we have uh, Tanya Ateo, who is an Impact Lab alumni, an MBA alumni, um, and she also runs a venture called Teo, um, and she's a fellow of the RSA. And we have uh, Rosine, who, Rosine Dillon, who is um, a Map the System alumni and winner of 2018, um, and she did an incredible um, project on the first-hand effects of the opium crisis. Um, and you can still see her project on the Map the System website, actually, you can go have a look at it. Um, some incredible insights. And then we also have uh, Sean Andrew joining us today. Sean is a systems change and complexity coach, and he works with Forum for the Future and the School of System Change. So a big welcome to our judges, and thank you so much for giving your entire weekend to us. <clears throat> and uh, just a shout out as well to our associate judges who helped us uh, Yesterday, many of your Map the System um, tutors who also made it possible to judge uh, 45 teams. Um, so this is the program today. We're going to be um, having three presentations and a break and another three presentations again. Um, the, um, and then the break will be in the common room at the back where you guys have all been. That's the fancy room with all the flags are in. Um, and then our lunch will be from 1 to 2.30 where the judges will deliberate and we'll give you a call back on um, text message, if you can come back earlier or not, we'll let you know how it goes. So it might take an hour and a half, depending on how it goes. Uh, yesterday, there was a lot of debate in the judging room, um, which is fantastic. It just shows the rigor and commitment that the judges put to this. All right, so um, I'm going to introduce Peter now to start um, going through the teams for our uh, presentations. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Bronwyn, and thank you, Faith. That was so great. Um, loved it, um, and thank you for being here. Um, I know it was difficult for you to get here. So before we start, just a reminder that even though it's not really a competition, there is a competition, and there's some prizes on the line, and that, in fact, we have not just six judges, but hundreds of judges. All of you are judges today as well. There's an audience award. Um, so each of you watching online and here in Oxford will be able to vote on one of the finalists uh, for the audience award today as well. So big responsibility, pay attention, um, and we'll have a live poll um, uh, at the end of the presentations this afternoon for all of you to vote as well. Okay, so remember we have six finalists. We are going in no particular order. They're all amazing. And without further ado, let's get started by welcoming the team who uh, drew the short straw. Now they get to go first. Our friends at the University of Chicago discussing roadblocks to sustainable palm oil production. Welcome. Video from yeah. 
Oh, we're just putting on a video, apparently. Yeah. Just one moment, please. I don't know if it's on the YouTube. Good morning, judges, audience. We are from the University of Chicago, and we are here to present our topic, which is sustainability issues of palm oil production in Indonesia. First, I'm going to introduce our team. My name is Kevin. This is Simeon. We are, from, we are Indonesian. This is Rina from South Korea. Nicole from Puerto Rico. And Ria, she couldn't be here. She's from the Philippines. Our diverse background has helped us in making, mapping the system behind palm oil production. We understand the urgency of raising awareness of this unsustainable issue, the need to provide value-added issue maps and identify levers, as palm oil is an important ingredient and critical for most consumer products. When you eat food today, take a shower, feed your pet, or wear makeup, without realizing you have used products that contains palm oil. Most likely, it contains palm oil from Indonesia, as Indonesia produced 59% of the world's supply at 44 million metric tons annually. Even though using these consumer products makes life easier, production of palm oil as, criti production of palm oil as critical ingredient brings negative impact to the environment and human life. These are the observable effects of unsustainable palm oil production, such as acidification. As we plant palm oil, it actually reduces the quality of the soil. Deforestation is the cheapest way to open up new plantation area to increase palm oil production. And there's land disputes with local residents and forced labor. In the next slide, I will show you a video of Zulkifli, a palm oil farmer in Sumatra, Indonesia. Kira-kira sebulan, hmm. kalau boleh tahu, hmm. pendapatannya Pak Zulkifli berapa? Oh, dong? pendapat saya paling-paling 300 ribu per bulan. 300 ribu? Iya. Itu hmm. makanya... He said that he earned 17 pounds sterling per month, while the minimum wage in Sumatra, his region, is 150 pounds per month. As a team, we could not imagine how he can avoid houses, food, or provide education for his family with only 17 pounds monthly. This is a Singaporean media coverage. Sadly though, Indonesian media rarely covers this issue, as this is new information and surprising information for me and Simeon, who are Indonesian. We are not aware of this issue before our research. This personal connection and unfairness encourage us as a team to find out how the system works in this issue. Here we decided through our research that we had four main system uh, that we looked at. The first off was economic, social, governmental and environmental. In these cycles, there are negative reinforcing actions that creates unsustainable palm oil. In the first slide, we see the social systems. There's two key takeaways that we need to see from this causal loop. The first off is that palm oil only provides low-skilled labor, which means that we defund education in that region. And the second is that most of these farms tend to be the only monopoly in the region. Therefore, there is very little incentive to talk, out, uh, talk about human rights abuses and very little power for people to speak up. We did an interview with uh, the Secretary General of the Palm, uh, Palm Union, and he basically explained to us that while palm oil employs 4.2 million people in Indonesia alone, that we officially know, um, they still fall predator to loan sharks and other predatory business practices. The second system loop that we really need to look into has also two key takeaways. The first off is that palm oil is an incredibly lucrative plant oil that produces the most oil out of any other vegetable. And the second is that when every other industry grows, because palm oil is in everything, it increases uh, the uh, capital gains of palm oil itself. 
Here we can see on one side the comparison of how much oil palm produces compared to soy and sunflower. You would think that this would trickle down into gains for farmers, but it actually doesn't because they're stuck in really steep quotas that they can't manage. And the other side, we see the predicted gains of palm oil between 2020 and 2026. So we have a middle class increasing in areas like India and China that really want to buy consumer products. And when they do, they inflate the price of palm oil in its wake. This is our government system loops. There's three things here, incentive to go cheaper, population growth, but I want to focus on money and politics. Str there's a strong reliance between business sector, political candidates, and political parties, especially in the provision of campaign funding. The high cost of politics in Indonesia is at the root of the problems. It is marked with the practice of political dowry to be nominated by political parties and money politics to gain votes. In 2019, two presidential candidates campaigned to increase the production of palm oil without uh, explaining the negative externalities of uh, increasing the plantation area. This does not happen only on national level, but regional level. Politicians seek support through loosening the regulations around forest pro protection and allow for more land to be either be given to or purchased by firms. Profitability of palm oil leads to land conversion. Most of the time, it includes burning and losing the forest. It leads to climate change. And by, uh, by top of that, by planting palm oil tree, it depletes mineral in soil and also it causes soil exhaustion. Also, we face food insecurity because we do have less land for other crop. So here, I want to draw your attention to key players. There are two key players. One is government. Government has high interest because they want to create jobs. They do also have high influence because they can regulate the policy related to palm oil. As well as uh, big companies, they do have high interest because their objective is to create uh, profit. They do also have high influence because they have a lot of resource. Government and companies hold the most power to enact positive change. Here are the two existing solutions by Indonesian government. First, they establish agency which oversees the policy related to palm oil. Also, they issue ISPO certification and it will be elaborated by my colleagues. For our gaps and levers, we have the first is the conflict of interest. The agency is funded by the people and for the people. Sadly enough, as of now, there are only, we found like three biggest companies representing in the board of directors that can change the policy making process in the agency. And we found no farmer's representation in the advisory committee. This is being uh, criticized also by the congressman that we interview, which is Mr. Ansilema, that also criticized, that also questioned how can this agency is established this way. Here, we found a way to lever, which is to streamlining authority and coordination in which to involve more farmers, limit big companies' role to ensure check and balances. How can we do that? Change the regulation. The second one is the deficiencies of certification. Even though the government has changed the regulations and standardization since 27, 2011, I mean, but there's still lack of protection of um, human rights and biodiversity in the, sorry, in the biodiversity in the principles of the ISPO compared to the RSPO that is used by the global stakeholders. We also find some we also find some deficiency here for, for the certificate for certification in which um, th there's an issue of independency because the ISPO is issued by the gov by the authority that also abided into the procedures and standardizations and principles that is set by the government. Here, we found a way to lever it by actually combining the RSPO and ISPO principles to close the gap and also to do joint audits to close the gap of the, in the, uh, the issue of the independency of the authorizing agency. The next one is the, about the local farmers. Since 2020, the local farmers is mandated to acquire certification. With that, certific with, with that mandate, there comes a high cost for the local farmers. As of now, there is no solution from the government to help those local farmers to acquire certification and to go sustainable. Here, we found a way to lever it by, by utilizing the resources that is um, that, ha that, that the agency has, because in 2020 alone, there's like the, they, can, they can raise funds until up to like 
1.6 billion US dollar, while for the local farmers, they only allocate 160 million US dollar. There's a very, very small number, right? So here, we'd like to utilize the agency as a part of the government to, to intervene. Lastly, we'd like to draw your attention to one critical conclusion, which is the resources and the lives here are at stake. We have seen so many opportunities and challenges, and we see how we can leverage the gap. But we also see that the big companies, the big powers, actually have the power to enact the positive change, and we need them. But sometimes it doesn't work. But it doesn't mean also that we have to be pessimistic about it, because we are also the stakeholders here. As my colleague said, we, you and I, we use palm oil products. The small changes start from us. The small changes can change all the system mapping, and that's what we found here. And next time you use the palm oil products, please be mindful of the system mapping behind this issue. That is, for, that is all from us. Thank you very much, and we are all open for questions. Well done, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. We've learned a lot from your presentation. Um, you talked a little bit about different mindsets and mental models, and I was curious if you could maybe speak to one or two of those that you found really challenging or really surprising to discover in your research. Um, so maybe just highlighting a couple of those for us. Yeah, this is a very interesting one. There are two actually mental models that we found in our iceberg model that we name as Palmberg model instead. So the first one is the one-sided and myopic beliefs. We did our research, and we also confirmed it with one of uh, the Secretary General of Palm Oil uh, Unions, which they confirmed that actually there is like one mentality for, with the farmers that they care about the profits. They care about that this is the way they can uh, gain profits. This is the way they can, they can uh, buy foods. They can buy houses. And that is the mentality that because because they, they are, there's difficulty for them to move, because the social movement here is very difficult also in the society, and the mental model makes them stuck here, and it is uh, being utilized by also the big companies to, to keep processing, gain, reaping profits, and uh, extending the plantations, palm oil plantations. So this is one of our mental model we can uh, explain here. Yeah, I, want to, want to, I, I wanted to. Um, yeah. I wanted to add to that that um, even though palm oil doesn't give as much money as they deserve for minimum wage, right? This is the only industry that provides, um, you know, basic childcare and things that we really take for granted. So there's a mental model that as long as they at least provide this, then it's okay. And there's no real push for other uh, mo more modern models like ESG or some kind of sustainability for social good in companies. So that's something that really holds Indonesia back in smaller regions. I might add something to that. Because the nature of the labor in, in this area is low-skilled labor, they're, they're relying heavily on this industry. So from their point of view, it is for their benefit to work within this industry. It is the only hope for them in that region. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, great. Well done, guys. Um, I've got two questions. We'll see if I get, I get to both of them. Um, I think my first one is about sort of heterogeneity in a system. So you've talked about Indonesia, which is a huge place um, with lots of different diversity and lots of different politics and different places, lots of different ecology. So I'd like you to talk about differences within the system and whether you're seeing different dynamics or whether you're seeing innovation within different parts of that system or whether this sort of quite high level mapping um, is applied equally. Yeah, in our process of report, uh, mapping the system, we're actually thinking also whether we see the whole region because Indonesia is very large and we have like 17,000 islands, more than 17,000 actually. So we, we want to focus on two big islands here. One of them is the island where Zupli place uh, lives, which is Sumatra, and also Kalimantan because the two islands hold the most forests in Indonesia and uh, probably in the world. So, we found that also there are so many characteristics of Indone uh, Kalimantan and Indonesia because in Sumatra, sorry, Kalimantan and Sumatra Island. Because in Sumatra alone, there are like 
more than five provinces, and we have our own traditional ethnicity, traditional customs, and other things. And uh, also, the mindset of the people are very differ, uh, different from each other. But the thing that the, we found like some uh, common thing here is that the business and even the government has the same interest, which is the profits, right? So. Uh, even though there are characteristics that in, uh, the, the people can actually leave from other uh, kind of jobs, for example, in Kalimantan, people tend to work also in mining because there are so many mines in Kalimantan, but in Sumatra, they tend to be more agricultural in, in character. But uh, the company can actually like uh, put their one uh, com uh, common interest, which is for the profits by planting these uh, plant, uh, palm oil plantations. And sadly enough, those companies, part of them, are actually owned by the, uh, the government. I want to add something to that mm -hmm. too. It is not impacting only to Indonesia, but the region surrounding Indonesia. Because like Singapore, a country close to Indonesia, I can understand why their uh, media coverage is from the Singapore. Because they're actually being bothered by the smoke of deforestation that has happened like, uh, more than twice annually from Indonesia. Uh, that's why like, I can understand if it's like Singaporean media that covers that one. Okay. Okay. Great, so my second question. Um, you know, we sometimes talk about system, systems innovation as changes to parts of the system and then how the system fits together. And I'd be curious if you'd reflect on sort of the solutions or changes that you put forward and how your systems map would look different, how your causal loop diagram would look different if those, um, those interventions were put into place. I can answer that one. So if we actually change the underpinning issue, which is the mental models are very one-sided, right? Let's imagine if we did apply ESG and we did apply some social changes to corporations, right? We still have the issue where small farmers just can't afford new technologies or they don't have access to these technologies in their region, right? You have to think of the externalities of, okay, how do we reach those innovating farming practices in very rural areas? How do we teach people? What about the language barrier, right? There's these other things that we need to teach these populations how to rejuvenate their own land and how to get new technologies to use less unsustainable palm oil, right? That our mapping will totally change into basically technology sector and how to improve these people's um, lives and education, which, you know, but first we need to change the, the mental handicap of profitability. So, so if, you go, yeah. if you go back to your causal loop diagram, show me where those will change. Show me where you have a, a balancing loop come in or, or, or a new connection built. Yeah. Oh yeah, I can give one example for that. Yeah, so for example, I mentioned about how the agency has conflict of interest, right? So conflict of interest tends to uh, also caused by the, the elections. There's like money in politics. And if we can see from the government's uh, loops here, the money in politics plays a role in the causal and effect. And if we, if we cut that down, we can see that the lack of environmental regulations that favors palm oil production can be cut also. So here we want to do our mapping system by like uh, making it in cycle, causal effect, so we can see if we cut this one, is there any effect of this one? So that is how our, uh, when we want to map our system, that's the mentality that we, that we uh, adopt here. This is probably one of example if you can uh, expand here. Yes, yes. Thank you, and, and, uh, well done with some hard questions. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Do we shimmy our Thank you. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Have you ended? There's also questions. Oh, okay. Oh. 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 Oh, no? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Awesome job. Well done. Okay. I know, I know. I love palm oil too. Please, please. Okay, thank you. As Faith leaves, she has to head off back to London. Just appreciate the coordination.
Well, appreciating face awesomeness is wonderful. I was appreciating the coordination of her earrings, her top, and those amazing <laughs> trainers. It's a good look. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well done to University of Chicago. I think a uh, really important lesson that systems change always requires reconfigurations of power. Okay, let's move on to number two. Uh, and welcoming the team closest to home here in Oxford, the Lancaster University, who's gonna be talking to us about the shadow pandemic of domestic violence. Thank you. Good behind closed doors should not stay there. Good morning to one and all. Today we're here to shine light on the spousal domestic violence faced by women in the state of Karnataka, India during the pandemic. As per the 2020 United Nations study, the pandemic increased the incidence of violence suffered by women across the globe in the hands of their intimate partners, causing the growth of the shadow pandemic amidst the COVID-19 crisis. I would prefer to die of corona rather than dealing with this torture, said a domestic violence survivor staying with her husband in Karnataka. Our research on NGOs, survivors, officers of the law, and caseworkers case brought to light the challenges faced by women in the state and how being confined in small spaces led to higher instances of inter interpersonal violence and abuse. Our research shows that one in three women have faced some sort of spousal violence in India, aged between 18 and 49. Our scope of research is Karnataka, as the number of domestic violence cases rose from 21% to 44% during the pandemic. Our significant focus is on how COVID-19 acted as a catalyst, as domestic violence complaints contributed to the highest gender-based violence complaints, wherein it was the all-time highest in the last two decades during the pandemic. Prejudice towards women is entrenched in various Indian cultures and religions, as also stated in the Hindu code of conduct, Manusmriti. Blockbuster Indian movies glorify abusive relationships. Numerous Indian politicians are accused repeatedly of crimes against women. The casual usage of it is okay, this happens between a husband and a wife, it's no big deal, are all instances that lead to the normalization of spousal violence in the country, and it is thus important to look at the bigger picture and understand the root cause. Based on our research findings, Karnataka not only has the highest percentage of spousal violence cases, but also the highest level of underreporting. According to the National Crime Records Bureau, only 8% of women report spousal violence. However, according to the survey conducted by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, 40% of women have actually encountered some sort of spousal violence. In 2019, the disposal rate of cases was merely 51%, and it takes on an average one year to reach a final verdict which is in stark contrast to the 60 days cap set by the DV Act for disposal. But the struggle doesn't end there. Karnataka currently has the highest percentage of men justifying spousal violence, and only 20% of the funds allocated by the central government has been utilized to combat gender-based violence. This shows not only the lack of emphasis on DV, but the poor awareness and implementation of the DV Act. And all of these are driven by the religious belief that marriage is a sacred union of seven generations. A woman is perceived as a property of her husband, and a good woman is the one who portrays her unquestioned obedience towards her husband, no matter what. And the pandemic helped bring into forefront what happens behind closed doors and show to the rest of the world that not all marriages are made in heaven. We identified three main factors that contributed to the increased reporting of spousal violence during the pandemic. First, the omni-channel awareness campaigns driven by both central and state government to make women aware of what constitutes a spousal violence. Second, the close proximity to their abusive partners throughout the lockdown. And the third, the loss of jobs during the pandemic which made women more vulnerable. 
During the systems map, we, we understood that pandemic only acted as a catalyst and there are several systems that failed to create a supportive environment for the survivors for decades. Majority of the survivors belong to patriarchal families who believe that a woman without a husband has no prospects, thus condemning divorced women. When they reach out to the police and report the crime, they mostly face of having to they mostly face the hurdle to having the having to convince the police that they are victims of abuse. Most of this police personnel are part of the same patriarchal society who grew up, who believe that this is not a crime, but an internal matter which needs to be resolved between a husband and a wife. If they're fortunate enough and the case reaches the court, it takes one to five years to reach a final verdict. And although the maximum duration of shelter homes is only 30 days. During the pandemic, there was a huge unavailability of shelter homes and the poor hygiene of those homes, along with the poor infrastructure of healthcare systems, exacerbated the situation for women during the pandemic. And what happens when a woman who, is, who has never been given a choice throughout her entire life is exhausted financially, emotionally, and physically? She comes back to the only place she recognized as her home, and that is her abusive partner. Thus, the cycle of violence continues. So we've identified solutions that are currently in place to tackle domestic violence cases properly. However, most of them prove to be ineffective. Following the brutal gang rape in 2013 that shook the nation, the central government established Nirbhaya Fund to address violence against women. However, by early 2022, only 46% of the total fund allocated across the country has been utilized, and that too, for purposes it was not established for. The Karnataka state government took the initiative of establishing 36 all-women's police station, which is a laudable initiative. However, in reality, most of them have male police station there, which defeats the purpose of having an all-women's police station. The central government also established a number of faster courts with the intention of reducing pendency rates in lower courts. However, what this solution fails to address is the underlying issues of long-drawn evidence collection process, lawyers exploiting loopholes in the system, and lack of court personnel in the Indian courts. All these factors lead to low conviction rate of abusers, thus leading to citizens' mistrust of the criminal justice system. Our research on the solutions landscape revealed four gaps in the systems that perpetuates the cycle of spousal violence, and one of them is the lack of implementation of the Domestic Violence Act. This can be addressed by re-engineering the criminal justice process and building human capacity at courts, which will then contribute to reducing the pendency of cases. Lack of holistic and survivor-centric support can be addressed by curating sensitization programs specific for each stakeholders, providing vocational training courses to survivors and allowing survivors to stay at shelter homes until their case disposal will prevent them from having to go back to their abusive husbands for support. Across the country, not just in Karnataka, there is a huge lack of awareness concerning, regard, uh, concerning domestic violence. One solution is to start training school teachers to deliver sex education properly. By changing the helpline numbers to easily memorable three-digit numbers, as opposed to, say, 10-digit numbers, we can increase accessibility to reporting for survivors. Our systems map reveal that domestic violence is not just a social issue, but also a public health crisis. Our research reveals the complexity and the scale of this issue, and led us to believe that women from lower... So Sorry, it opened our eyes to some existing biases and assumptions, but news reports led us to believe that women from lower socioeconomic class tend to face more domestic violence cases. But our research reveals that women from all socioeconomic class face spousal violence in India and that society's expectations of their reactions or their response to such violence differs. The criminal justice system and survivor-centric survivor support system is not survivor-centric, which is reflected in the current solutions in place. In some cases, 
These systems even perpetuate the cycle of violence. As an international community of scholars, the first step towards the destigmatization of domestic violence is by ensuring that what happens behind closed doors do not continue to happen. The easiest way we can help tackle domestic violence in India from afar is by advocating for domestic violence survivors on social media platforms, focusing on issues ranging from ease of reporting to better access to mental health resources. By providing further research for effective implementation of the interventions we've identified, we can gradually create systemic and sustainable change. Thank you. I would just take a moment to introduce the team, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, so that's Saurabhi from India, that's Vida from India. We have Chloe from Hong Kong, China, Akriti from India, and I'm Ashna from India as well, and we're from Lancaster University. Thank you. Amazing job. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and shedding some light on things that are happening behind closed doors. Uh, my question is if you could share a bit about what you've learned from outside of your system's um, boundary, perhaps something that you've seen outside in terms of places, because you've mentioned a few interventions or possible next steps. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you have any case studies or things you've seen in your research that show you that these results can happen. And for example, like the, the number, um, having a telephone number that you can remember, yeah. um, where have you seen these things working and how might they apply to uh, the system that you've been working on? Of course. Should I start? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so I run a nonprofit in India that works towards sexual violence against women. We don't specifically deal with domestic violence. Currently, we deal with child sexual abuse, but we do engage with a lot of other NGOs. You know, because child sexual abuse also comes under domestic violence sometimes issues at home. So that's where we started our research. We started. We can't interview. You know survivors for ethical purposes, but we interview a lot of caseworkers from other NGOs across the country, and uh, they were very helpful. They also conduct um, <coughs> studies on their own, for example, uh, Council to Secure Justice, like in New Delhi, for example, they conducted a study to understand how different court systems are unable to support you know, survivors to actually report. So from pre-reporting to post-reporting phases. So we conducted our research uh, on ground with NGOs who are working uh, and caseworkers were working directly with victims, seeing how things play out for them. Uh, that was the first one. Secondly, we also emailed and tried to contact a lot of policymakers, uh, government agencies, uh, set to say we haven't received any response, uh, which is quite telling of the, the attention on the, on the issue. Um, did I cover everything? Just, I, I'm blanking out, sorry. <laughs> if I could just follow up on that, the impact of some of those case studies you've seen, you know, that give you yeah. hope that it's going to work in your system. Mm -hmm. Any results on that or on things that you see in terms of data um, that these things are, these interventions can work and have worked in smaller pockets, or other systems? Any information on that? Yes. So um, training school teachers to deliver sex education properly, that was, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a study done under restorative justice for some reason, and, um, but it's, it's, again, pertaining to child sexual abuse again, but that really uh, works for domestic violence as well, um, because again, it, at the end of the day, it's, it's a power dynamic. Um, so that's one thing we saw in that research. Um, easily memorable helpline numbers, that has been told but to us by all our interviewees. Like, it's so difficult for women, to because they're in distress. It's hard for them to, re to remember nine to ten digit numbers. Rather, you want to go and, you know, like, type one to one. That's significantly easier. So it, it's, it's proven by our interviewees that this actually works. Um, there isn't any data-backed research done yet. Um, I would like to um, add to that point. Uh, some of the other solutions that uh, we looked outside of the systems map was the restorative justice. So we spoke mm -hmm. to uh, Urvashi Tilak, she runs Council for Security Justice, where she works directly with the uh, abusive partners as well as the children of uh, the uh, <coughs> survivors. So the responsibility is basically to talk to these children and make them understand consent and what constitutes as abuse. Because when you're part of that uh, environment, you perceive that as normal. Mm -hmm. 
and most of these, uh, when they ask people that, why have you done this? They said, I have seen this when, when I was a child. My father used to do that to my mother. So I think that's normal in a, a relationship between a husband and a wife or even the intimate partners. So I think the whole point of the systems map revealed that it needs to start at the ground level, starting from sex education to telling people what constitutes as consent, what is the good and what is bad in a relationship. And just because um, she's your wife, you can't just beat her up. And another thing I would like to take it up because we did not address this here, mostly because it still is not considered as domestic violence, that is marital rape. Mm -hmm. India is one of the very few countries where still not recognized marital rape. They think that it's all right to rape your wife because once you're married, your husband can sleep with you or have sex with you whenever he feels like. And those complaints are still not accounted for. So I hope it addresses your questions. Okay. <clears throat> Great job and thank you very much for sharing. It's a difficult topic and I really appreciate your vulnerability. Um, I'd like to ask a bit of a question. You know, often in these systems, we're talking about very insidious kind of cultures that are very difficult to address. I think the culture that you've spoken to is not insidious. It's glaringly obvious that there are deeply indoctrinated power imbalances between genders. Yeah. Did your research discuss how you could improve partnerships between women and men? Did you engage with men throughout your research and did you receive any kind of unique insights from them about how those relationships might be improved or they could be allies in gaps and levers for solutions? Take the question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fine. So yes, as I spoke about the restorative justice, which um, is there, uh, some of the NGOs are currently doing, running that, but I don't, we did not, we just only spoke to one or two people who are, who are currently working between resolving the relationship between a husband and a wife. But uh, let me just show you the first, sorry, second slide. Sorry, give me some moment. It's a lot of animations. <laughs> so, yeah, so these are all the, <clears throat> What we tried to, tried to capture here is, um, so most of the, some, there have been instances where the woman has herself bailed out the husband, like she reported the complaint, and the very next day she just went and bailed out her husband because she can't live without him, she can't survive. And uh, yes, the restorative justice system needs to be there where they speak to them that you, you can't do this to your wife, and even if you're a wife, you should not, uh, like take it, take it all in, you can report it. And the whole, they, they spoke about one thing that given, give this woman a choice, like what does she actually want to do? Just don't enforce her, okay, okay um, that uh, you can go to the police, you should go to the court. Give her the agenda because most of these women come from families, as been found out during our systems map, who are not given a choice throughout their life. Since their childhood, they are ta taught that this is normal, this is normal, this is normal. So when they get married, they still consider that as normal. So it's all about giving them an agency and that's what, what we are here for, to give them that choice yeah. to get out and do what they want to do about their lives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Minakshi Giri, the trustee for uh, Durga India, also talked about her and her partner, uh, uh, the efforts and initiative that's spent on trying to educate men on what constitutes DV. And uh, we thought it was a good idea um, to kind of complement um, a global initiative. I forgot the name. It's, it's not, it's in the UK. It's, I think it's a white ribbon, yes, it's a white ribbon campaign. For, yeah, so, so you focus on, um, on men to make them understand that this is on you and not just saying for women, this is what you do. So you, you can prevent it. So that's one of the things that they're starting, initiatives they're starting, to change the dynamic between men and women, and also ask men, like, hey, you're in a good position to do this, so you're in a bit, much better position to address this, what are you gonna do about it? Um, so that's the initiative they're starting to educate men to, to be more proactive in tackling DV cases. Thank you. Yeah, well, well done, thank you so much. <laughs> you. I just wanna loop back to one of your earlier slides when you talked about the Hindu text and also in, yeah. in media. And lifting up, you're alluding to their kind of the, the story or the myth or the narrative that's perpetuating even the mental models. And just a question around through your inquiry, through your diagnosis, did you learn anything around you know, what might be the new story? Um, what might be some barriers to creating a new story? 
so I saw in, in one of your interventions in Gap 3, you talk about social media, radio stations. It'd be lovely just to hear a little bit more about that. So how might you actually uh, influence the story through a narrative-based systems change approach? Mm. Right. Yeah, I can take the. Okay, you take. Uh, I can start with the Hindu Code of Conduct. So, um, it clearly says that uh, if a good woman at desiring to go to the same world should never do anything displeasing, and that is perpetuated through generations. And in the Manuspriti, it is written actually they can beat her up also. I want to address the uh, Bollywood blockbuster movie. So this is one of the movies, one of the very few movies. It. At the same year, two movies came out. This movie spoke about violence and glorified it. Another movie spoke about you should not, uh, you should not uh, tolerate domestic violence. That this was the highest grossing movie. So you can understand how normalized it is and the government has never taken any initiatives to like, promote this kind of cinema. And the film director and various viewers themselves have said, if you love someone, you can beat them up. What is the big deal about it? And, I'm saying this is one of my friends. I'm still not, I'm, I'm not friends with that person anymore. <laughs> he said that to me. <laughs> so, yeah, and um, yeah, and the interventions, uh, if you want to talk about. Yeah, we decided to uh, focus more on radio stations. And I know they seem like outdated technology. And a lot of people, the current solutions tend to focus on digital technologies. But the problem with that is that with phone, because the dynamic and the tactics used by abusers, especially when it comes to, in, in India, they pre pay recharge phones or without you can't use it. So it doesn't matter, you can't even call emergency line numbers. Actually you do, no that's right, you can call it. Um, so it's, it's difficult for women to have access to platform for reporting because it's, that's the platform that you know, the men are uh, you know, in charge of, right? The abusers are in charge of. So uh, through radio stations, it's easier for them because you can't really turn, you, you don't know what's gonna come on radio stations. So it it's, seems like an outdated technology, but it's much more effective in making sure that the message goes across and hopefully someone out there receives it if there are people we are not aware of. Um, and only 50% of women currently have access to cell phones in our country, uh, even internet. Yeah. Also so in the major city. Major cities. Not, yeah. So, but most of the solutions have been digital, even though they don't have access to those digital platforms. So it's all about making everything survivor-centric so that they have various channels through which they can report and thus re reporting can increase and they have the data to understand okay. where the solutions need to be in the future. Mm -hmm. Maybe just to follow up, are there any signals of change of new <laughs> stories emerging or... Uh, I, I would say, um, so I, I work in a nonprofit again, and a lot of people come to me and say, I don't think what you guys are doing is great because we see an increase in reporting all the time, and people are very skeptical, you know, they're negative about it. I would like to contradict that and say, that's a really good thing because if you don't report it, how are you going to get justice? The fact that women are now brave enough to come up and say, hey, I know this is wrong, and I want to get the justice that I deserve. That's a good thing, that's one step. And I think that's one small step towards getting justice, towards tackling this. Um, so that, I think that's good enough of an evidence for me to say yes, some of the things, solutions we do are working and we should keep working on better solutions. Absolutely. <laughs> are we good? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the team from Lancaster University. A big part of shifting power in systems is about first giving voice to those who have been on the receiving end of oppressive systems, and I think you did a brilliant job of that. Uh, we have uh, our third presentation, which will be followed by a break. So settle in, it's going to be great. Um, at this time, I'm pleased to welcome the team from the University of Cape Town who will be discussing financial exclusion in South African mortgage provision. Welcome, team.
as the housing bubble burst in property markets around the world, South Africa's affordable market, which is predominantly um, driven by uh, people of color, surprised the market by outperforming other segments, with housing prices ri rising 10 times the rate um, of other housing stock despite the recession. This was lauded as an opportunity to transform and provide a lifeline to the wounded housing market, and the strong performance was due to a reduction in interest rates, which demonstrates that a small change in credit terms provides a large improvement in accessibility. The affordable market, or what we call the missing middle, refers to households who are um, not poor enough to access government-funded housing, but too poor to access traditional mortgages. This encompasses um, the, uh, this encompasses people such as teachers, police officers, nurses, builders and security guards, amongst others. And the average incomes here show that um, it's predominantly people of color who were previously disadvantaged under apartheid. Apartheid was a system of um, institutionalized racial oppression that lasted nearly 50 years, ending in 1994. During this period, three and a half million people of color were um, forcibly removed from their houses and forced to live in um, areas designated by race which were far from economic hubs and desperately lacked basic service delivery. To date, South African geographies and classes are still highly racialized and we have the highest income inequality in Africa. These images show the current racial distribution in South Africa's three largest metros. White populations in purple are closest to economic hubs and affluent areas. After apartheid, people of color gained access to formal credits and lenders rushed to capture the emerging middle class. This important period of market making abruptly froze when the 2008 financial crisis hit and banks tightened credit requirements to protect themselves. Despite the promise of the affordable market in the 2010s, by 2017, only 4% of mortgages originated were to the missing middle, and 83% of first-time black home buyers were considered ineligible. The stars had seemed to be aligned. Over 7 million households were in the missing middle and growing. There was an emerging um, middle class hungry for upward mobility. There was a well-established property market and a strong financial sector, as well as housing policies specifically structured to realize um, home housing rights through home ownership. So the surface of this problem shows an over-indebted missing middle with little savings, as well as an uncoordinated financial administrative system with little trust between stakeholders. However, when looking deeper, these events revealed that the dependence on unsecured lending was being used to supplement the lack of real income growth, as well as poor credit household management caught the missing middle in poverty traps and debt cycles, which the interviewees consistently refer to as feeling stuck in a system with no agency or consumer-based solutions. This was reinforced through a credit system that was purposely built for the white minority and created significant accessibility issues once services were extended to people of color. These system attributes were shown to be grounded in mental models that previously disadvantaged groups were seen as unreliable and risky. And it was also revealed that the disenfranchisement of home ownership under apartheid resulting in housing symbolizing stability and security for black South Africans. And within this, importantly, redress and reform is considered a government responsibility. So these system qualities not only prevented the upward mobility and wealth accumulation of black South Africans, but it actively contributed towards reinforcing South Africa's racist housing segmentation. Let's look closer at what the mortgage market solidified into during the 2008 global financial crisis using our systems map. The major stakeholder groups are private sector, um, the public sector, intermediaries such as researchers, prop tech companies, and innovative startups, mm -hmm. and the households that make up the missing middle. The sudden explosion of potential bondholders that came with freedom for South Africa was new for major mortgage providers. Lenders from the time reported making decisions on how to lend to the affordable market based on their gut, as data and experience were unavailable. Um, in other words, housing transactions were informed by moral judgments and the soci sociality of those in power who were um, heavily influenced by racial prejudice. These decisions continue to racialize risk assessment frameworks for mortgage applicants to date. And for example, a researcher that we spoke to um, noted that whether a property had a large plot size and telephone lines as an example of um, the safety of the property and by extension, its applicant. However, along the lines of apartheid, um, we know that previously disadvantaged areas where the bulk of affordable housing is situated, they st still experience um, desperately poor service delivery such that they lack telephone lines and plots are small. 
This directly contributes to the exclusion of the missing middle. And ultimately, the market ended up segmented between a traditional and an affordable market, um, and lending was territorialized around developed urban areas, which created artificial housing finance scarcity to drive high-risk premiums and other risk-related revenue streams. This segmentation was so lucrative for major lenders that the strength of private sector lobbying prevented government attempts to legislate more forceful lending to the affordable market. And it contributes to an ongoing mistrust that public funds made available to lenders for the missing middle will actually be passed on to consumers. This graph shows that affordable market mortgages are slightly riskier than traditional markets. However, something is typically paid towards arrears, which attracts additional interest, and the missing middle is less likely to prepay their mortgages, which all ultimately functions to support mortgage providers' returns. The rates of rejection of missing middle um, applicants is therefore actually financially counterintuitive. Government plays a key role in addressing the issue due to its impact on economic development. They drive the existing local solution landscape, which is broadly a poorly administered um, down payment subsidy, a government employee housing scheme, and a new and promising pub public-private partnership, or PPP, um, to provide affordable mortgage rates to the missing middle. <coughs> From the shortcomings of the um, solution landscape, the impact gaps we've identified are reporting and monitoring, system coordination and partnerships, and visibility. Poor administration, weak accountability measures, and corruption all contribute to the lack of sustainable solutions. In fact, we realize that we need consistent check-ins on the functionality and progress of the solutions that are implemented. And this can be invoked through political pressure and policy regulation. The private sector has also shown promise in its influence over government and can apply pressure to enact policy reform that could enable housing access. System coordination and partnerships speaks to making, or rather speaks to the private and public sectors operating in silos. There should be greater synergy in the efficiency that is offered by the private sector with the scale and system linkages that are offered by the public sector. ESG and impact link financing increases the funding that is available to service underserved markets such as the missing middle. Intermediaries can also facilitate PPPs and de-cost solutions using impact capital. And finally, visibility. Research shows that credit terms are inflated by information asymmetry, and this results in the misinterpretation of the real versus perceived risk of the missing middle. Financial illiteracy also contributes to credit mismanagement. Visibility speaks to making the missing middle more visible to lenders and making credit mechanisms more understandable to the affordable market. Intermediary participation is directed by its source of funding, either from government or developmental organizations. Their role enables them to generate informative data for mortgage providers' decision making and provide credit management counseling. These gaps are not unique to the affordable housing issue. In fact, they are visible across South African sectors that utilize systems that were not purpose-built for the new South Africa with a diverse middle class. As we can see on this map, pulling on these levers can create change and innovation. Innovation such as a human settlements development bank and a revision of the risk evaluation criteria and technology. So the levers that we have identified are critical to the effect positive change throughout the system. However, a conundrum that we faced while mapping the system was, so how do we get there? We used the three horizons to try and help answer this question. Through this current system, though the current system gives little hope to the missing middle, social pressure, government intervention, and private solutions are key attributes which will remain fundamental to improving the system. When looking closer at the exciting visionary landscape, such as te improving technological systems, community-based solutions, such as credit unions, as well as progress on PPP models, uh, we noticed that these were achieved through incremental adjustments and transformational experiments, such as the global SDG initiatives, um, government guarantees a crowd in the private sector, as well as blended finance. <clears throat> These could be considered pathways which help align levers with a visionary framework that functions to create an efficient and effective system accessible to all. 
One such pathway that was shown to be incredibly impactful in African markets was the use of centralized PPP liquidity organizations that resulted in increasing the Tanzanian market sevenfold and reducing interest rates in Kenya to single digits. This system, like many, is complex and intimidating. However, the financial inclusion of the missing middle into the mortgage market goes beyond just home ownership. It's the foundation to an equitable economy in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my question is, um, in systems, there'll always be contradictions. Um, and I'd love to know, on your own personal reflections, when you're looking at that, what were the contradictions that you found most difficult to reconcile? Or even not reconcile, but what did you find most difficult? Um, if I can take this, I think something that was really interesting is that, I mean, I spent some time uh, working with housing finance institutions or the, in the traditional market. And I understand that um, the private sector uses the, like, the best information that's available to them to try and govern their lending. And so we, um, when speaking to or interviewing some private sector actors, they said, no, our, our decisions are data-driven and experience-driven. It's not just driven by sort of risk proxies that are racialized. But then um, when we dug deeper, we saw that there was a... Um, almost a disregard for the missing middle just because the market was functional and profitable enough as it was just by offering low rates to a, tra to a smaller traditional market and that the uh, risk, as risk associated with the missing middle and the additional risk management that it, that it would take to lend to them um, sort of cordon that off to a sort of venture, um, venture segments of businesses. Um, I think that with this, we, it especially helped us to reconcile these um, the, the fact that while they are using data to drive their decision making, they, they ignore the, um, the missing middle largely because there are non-bank mortgage providers that have stepped in to fill the role of um, lending to the affordable market and trying to find innov innovative ways to service them. Um, that, that really took us a long time to understand that those mechanisms, because nobody's trying to ignore data, but because the, the mortgage market formed in such a hurried period and then suddenly was frozen before it really got to an, a mature state, and this is what we've been left with. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so quick question around that the H1, kind of the, the current horizon. And so you spoke to some of the barriers around whole of society approach, cross-boundary collaboration. I just want to zoom in a little bit on what did you discover through your diagnosis around intergovernmental transversal collaboration because, <clears throat> as you probably know, you know, many departments, their mandates are overlapping in a given region, so anything you uncovered through your mapping the system around intergovernmental relations and collaboration? Um, do you want to go ahead? No, you can go. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll just get it started. But, um, <laughs> uh, so we did interview um, a member of a government or like a, 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 a sort of department within government, and one of the key things that we identified was that their policies aren't necessarily going against what we're you know, proposing or what we're highlighting. The issue is that there is not a clear understanding of what needs to be, um, like what the problem is, right? There's this... Um, I think yesterday there was a quote about how the, I'm paraphrasing, but the power of the intervention is dependent on the intervener. And I think that's what's going on here, is that the government, in their attempts to intervene, because they don't actually, they haven't fully diagnosed what the issue is and how, you know, also because of the wide range of the people in the missing middle, it can, the, the nuanced differences between everyone's experiences can be difficult to um, sort of solve with a blanket solution. And so what's, what, they rea what they don't realize is that every, they need to nuance the proposed solutions. Um, and unfortunately, with regards to having poor administration and no accountability, no follow through, corruption, those things all contribute to the fact that they don't end up understanding the problem and they don't know what is needed by each person within the group. If 
I may add, sorry, Laura. Um, so we spoke to government and something that really shone through was the fact that there's obviously a municipal, provincial and national governments. Well, not obviously, that's how it is in South Africa. And um, a, a huge uh, driver of this issue, especially when it comes to the supply of housing stock rather than the supply of housing finance, has been the fact that local government has um, very poorly provided a sufficiently registered properties that are serviced by bulk infrastructure to support the supply of um, house, of housing, affordable housing, and um, when we talk to, uh, well, when we look at organizations that are uh, more at a national level, like the Human, um, set, what, the human Settlements Department, yes. Department of Human Settlements, <laughs> they, they try and drive change from their, their, um, from their position, but, and, and it benefits from national infrastructure, but it does, um, it, there's still a, a clog in like the local government um, sector. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there's, we mentioned briefly a Human Settlements Development Bank, which is gonna be a government-owned development finance institution, which no one really knows what, what it will do at this point, but it's been in the pipeline for 10 years with like an article yeah. every five years saying that it's coming. And um, when we interviewed the government, they, well, the member of government, they mentioned that they were aware of this, but no, they didn't know where it was. And it was very difficult to get an understanding. We spoke to journalists who had been involved in publicizing it in the beginning. And that's, that lack of system coordination is very much part of our impact gap of the lack of system coordination. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed uh, the amount of detail and the research that you put in the presentation that we had just now. And you've also been able to share a few of the voices of some of the stakeholders you spoke with. I'm curious if you could bring into the room some of the more unheard or vulnerable voices that you've been able to reach out to or hear from and perhaps talk about something that surprised or inspired you from those interactions. It's a beautiful question. Yeah. Uh, we'd yeah. love to answer yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> sure, I mean, one of just, I think something that we've realized as a team was that using the systems tools was incredibly helpful in understanding the issue, but the key essence of it all came through the interviews we had with the people within the missing middle. Because things like, um, one of our interviewees shared that there was a sense of shame that they, they felt when they went to go and apply for a mortgage. Because the, the person, the consultant that was assisting them took a, one look at their bank statement and was like, what do you think you're trying to do? Like, why are you applying for this? You cannot afford it. They tried to persuade them from moving into the place that, moving into the area they wanted to go to because they're like, there's no way you could belong here. You know, so there's a deep sense of shame that comes with that. There's also, um, within families, because of the, this generational sort of um, oppression, there's, there was, she did not know who to go to within her family when she wanted to apply for a mortgage. There was no one who could assist. Um, she depended on her colleagues. And she was lucky enough to find someone who was able to guide her not to choose um, an option that was going to have terrible um, so long-term consequences because the interest rate was extremely unaffordable. But those things like that, like financial illiteracy, um, it's such an incredible hindrance as well as there's a big mistrust between previously disadvantaged people and the private sector and banking because there's often instances where solutions are implemented to help them, but they end up taking advantage of them, taking advantage of the knowledge they don't have. Um, and so hearing those stories was really, um, it was really saddening um, and frustrating as well. May add, I, I have to, it's just such a great question. Like it, it, it really sort of hit home for us because I mean, we all come from previously disadvantaged backgrounds and so we've experienced firsthand um, the, the sort of sentiment towards don't, don't bother trying to look for a mortgage until you're earning a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one thing that was especially pertinent to me is that we interviewed someone who um, actually owned a home in a previously disadvantaged area in Cape Town. I wonder if I could show you it or the area. Um, so, uh, Cape Town is on the top right. So, here in the blue areas in Kailicha? Yeah. Kailicha. Yes, in the blue areas here. So, she lived in a predominantly black area and um, she wanted, she needed to move out because she was unsafe. Her, her um, grandson had sort of, uh, um, sort of got mixed up in some gang violence and they needed to leave quickly in the middle of the night. And so now she's paying a really high rent to live close to where she works, but she, she isn't able to sell her home in Kailicha and use that capital to buy a house um, because uh, the fact that mortgage finance is not available for those areas means that um, she can't 
charge a fair value. So um, I'm talking, uh, I don't know, to try and demonstrate, I think her house was va uh, valued at 850,000 Rand. I don't know what that is in pounds. <laughs> and they, um, the re real estate agent said the best that she would get was around 300,000 um, Rand, which is not enough to buy a house. Yeah. And it's, it's really, it's, it's, um, there's this like sort of major transfer of, of housing that's going on to lower income groups by the government, but that housing cannot be used for upward mobility because there's just no mortgages available for it. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Thank you to the University of Cape Town. Um, I always love these presentations because I learn so much, but I also love watching the educators nodding along really excitedly. Ron was so cute right behind me being like, yes, you got this. He's like a, you know, the uh, symphony conductor. Anyways, um, that was awesome. There's so much more to come. We've got a break now, but there's so much more to come. Not only do we have three more fascinating presentations, we've got live art, we've got a hot poet, and we've got a lot of awards. Um, so get psyched. It's now 11.15, we're exactly on time. Um, so we have a 30 minute break. For those of you online, just mute, leave yourself on, go get some refreshments, get some fresh air, etc. I'll ask that those who are here present, let's try to be back in the room in our seats at 11.40 so we can start right on time at quarter of. Thank you all and enjoy, see you back. Is that okay?
Okay, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we've had three fantastic um, presentations, and like I was saying in the break, we're learning things that we didn't know we didn't know, uh, which is what I love most about um, Math the System. So we have uh, three more presentations for you before lunch, and the next presentation um, is going to be um, the uh, City on the Rise, Students Left Behind, Education Inequality in Nashville, Tennessee, and that's Vanderbilt University. Please welcome them. Thank you. Welcome to Nashville, capital city of Tennessee. Every day, children wake up before sunrise and go to school. They spend eight hours away from home, learning to read and write and prepare for their future. In a city where business is booming, students and families are promised that their hard work will pay off. One day, they'll graduate high school with the skills they need to build a career and live a happy, successful life. For some, this is true. For many others, this is not. Let's look at two public schools in the heart of Nashville. Both are run by the public school district and both receive government funding. This is Hume Fogg, one of the best high schools in the country. Hume Fogg has dozens of college prep courses and highly qualified teachers. Nearly all their students graduate and 78% go on to earn a college degree. Three kilometers away sits Pearl Cone High School where 13% of graduates earn a college degree. They have only six college prep courses and few teachers stay more than three years. Most of Hume Fogg students are white and less than 10% come from a low income background while nearly all of Pearl Cone students are black and three quarters come from a low income background. In a city that is thriving and makes big promises to students, why should any be left behind? The 35 stakeholder interviews we conducted for this project all revealed the jarring realities of disparities within our school. In Nashville, these disparities are a product of an interconnected system that hinges on three main causes. Racially segregated housing, inequitable school funding, and barriers to school choice. But before exploring these root causes, we'd like to introduce you to an extraordinary Hume Fogg graduate, Savannah Ray, a passionate black indigenous student who grew up in a low income neighborhood. Savannah experienced some of the best that the public schools have to offer, as well as some of the worst. She was on a path to Pearl Cone, but unlike her friends, was redirected to Hume Fogg. And this radically changed her future. We are a team of education policy master's students from Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, and we spent the last several months investigating how Nashville systems impact students like Savannah. Let's start with the people. This is the vast network of stakeholders within Nashville's education system. Whether directly or indirectly, all of them have impacted how Savannah and her friends experience Nashville public schools. Before Hume Fogg, Savannah attended schools with primarily other students of color. This is because Nashville school, Nashville's neighborhoods are largely segregated. Though the US Supreme Court required schools to integrate in 1954, white families fled to the suburbs and bought houses in these areas with federal loans. Black families were denied loans in these same areas. At the same time, poor black families were displaced from their downtown Nashville homes due to large-scale demolition for urban development. These families moved to the only location available, low-quality housing in segregated neighborhoods. Today, economic growth perpetuates these decades-old housing patterns as gentrification and rising costs reinforce segregation of neighborhoods by race and wealth. This is why Savannah, like many other black Nashvillians, attended predominantly black schools. Now, <coughs> um, now, Savannah is a rare case. Because Savannah had exceptional test scores, she was assigned to a talented classroom within her school. From here on, she was on a path to Hume Fogg, a choice that was presented to her parents by her teachers and that her parents had the opportunity to choose for her. Her friends would continue to Pearl Cone, the local neighborhood school. Nashville boasts about its universal choice policy, which means that any family in this public school district can choose any public school within the district. However, there are barriers to accessing this choice. 
The district does not provide transportation outside of neighborhoods, and the public transportation system in Nashville is wholly inadequate. Savannah had to drive 40 minutes, and it cost $20 a day to park outside of Hume Fog. Additionally, the fear, the fear of not belonging keeps families from choosing schools outside their neighborhoods, and language and information barriers make the choice system very complicated for other families. Though Savannah is bright and a hard worker, opportunity allowed her access to information and peer group networks that opened up the world of choice for her. Additionally, funding drives inequity. Tennessee is ranked 44th in the nation in per-pupil funding. And while Nashville attempts to compensate for the lack of resources, students are not getting what they need. Savannah experienced inadequate resources firsthand. At her school before Hume Fogg, they were unable to incentivize high-quality teachers, and for a year, she was without both a history and a science teacher. At Hume Fogg, Savannah had access to well-resourced classrooms, and when the school wanted to spend beyond its budget, the Parent Teacher Association was able to raise additional funds. The Parent Teacher Association at Pearl Cone does not have access to the same community wealth, given its generally low-income student population. And when well-resourced families want to utilize school choice to leave low-performing schools, they take with them both public funds and this private wealth, which further segregates national schools. Wealthy schools are able to provide additional opportunities for students, while schools with low-income student populations struggle to meet the basic needs of their students, needs that are not filled by city social services, and needs that take time and resources away from academics. While Nashville attempts to fund its schools equitably, the students are not receiving the resources they need that lead to equal outcomes. Many stakeholders have tried to solve these problems, but efforts have largely fallen short. The city has implemented inclusive housing laws and created a few mixed income housing developments, but state policy has actually restricted these movements. Nashville has also expanded school choice in the past two decades, but there are too many barriers for all students to access the different options. And finally, Tennessee's education funding formula is outdated and confusing. In the past 30 years, Tennessee's student demographics have changed drastically, meaning that the current funding allocations don't really meet the needs of the current students. These solutions leave us with three gaps. One is that the solutions neglect families and communities. Two, policies don't fully understand the, the full needs of disadvantaged students, and three, the recent economic growth has not reached low-income communities in Nashville. So to address our first gap, we recommend that the district create an accessible web page that has all the information they need to know about the school choice process and options. And in the long term, the district should be partnering with museums and sports teams to host pop-up events at their schools. These actions can help reframe their schools as community centers for all the city's residents to uh, go to. And to address our second gap, Policies are another really powerful lever for change. Right away, the district should create stipends to attract high-quality teachers to move into the low-performing schools. And in the long term, the state should be repealing its harmful housing policies and instead offer tax breaks to encourage more mixed-income developments. And over time, these actions will create more integrated neighborhoods and equitable schools. And finally, since Nashville's businesses have benefited so much from the recent economic boom, they're in a strong position to reinvest in Nashville's future workforce. So immediately, the district should be partnering with these businesses to create more mentorship programs and internship programs for students and allow them to provide more direct services to the students as well. And over time, the, the city should require all, that all new businesses that come into the city to have a hiring floor for district graduates. These efforts will help create a diverse and sustainable school-to-career pipeline. Last month, Savannah graduated high school. Despite enormous barriers, she has a bright future ahead of her, off to American University in the fall. As she walked across the stage, she felt a sense of loss for her friends with fewer opportunities, some without college and career plans, some who dropped out of school, and some who lost their lives to gun violence. In Nashville, there's a pattern in who succeeds and who doesn't, not by intelligence and not by merit, but by privilege and resources. Factors outside the school building, including housing, funding, and school choice, all have profound impacts on the student experience. Nashvillians believe in the American dream, that hard work leads to success. 
But by attributing students' challenges to their own lack of effort, we are blinding ourselves to the real barriers they face. Changing systems also means changing hearts and minds, not just of lawmakers, but of communities at large. Doing this takes us one step closer to equity for all. Students don't fail, systems do. Thank you. Do you want to do want the pick up? I'll hold it. Never mind. I'll hold it. Come a little closer. Yeah, no, you can stay. No, you can stay there. It's good. We are ready for your question. We prepped those questions. Thank you so much for that. Um, just to kick off the questions, um, I'd love to hear how you would describe what the current system is producing right now, just in a short bit, and then talk about how you would like, what change you would like to see in the system and what that would produce if you could enact some of those interventions you mentioned. So right now, the, in the past year, the Tennessee Higher Education Commission actually published a report that said that only 56% of students in high school go to college in Tennessee. And so we would like to see that number increase because in the United States, it's currently essential for students if they would like to achieve a minimum, not a minimum, uh, the median wage across the country to go to college and get a higher education degree. The difference between people who do not attend college and the people who do is approximately double the salary. And so we would like to see schools that ultimately prepare students for higher education as well as schools that prepare students with basic literacy, which we are struggling to see also in the state of Tennessee. Because less than 33% of students in third grade are literate. I think we would also like to add that there are profound inequities in who succeeds and who doesn't in Nashville. Currently, black and Hispanic students are on average two grade levels behind their white peers in math and reading. Uh, additionally, black and Hispanic students graduate at lower rates, matriculate to college at lower rates, and are much more likely to be chronically absent or drop out of high school. This is the inequity that we base our project around, and we would love to see these gaps close, as well as a general increase in student achievement. Okay, I'm gonna ask you the same question pretty much that I asked you before, which, which maybe means that you didn't totally resolve it last time. So I'm gonna ask it again and maybe in a different way. So what I asked before was, is school choice a good, a good policy? And, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna elaborate a little bit. So you, you'd set up housing, funding, and school choice as your three drivers of inequality. Um, and you've said school choice isn't working. Um, so I'd like you to talk about what school choice working means and then also, you know, in, in your previous response, you sort of talked about sort of a, a perfectly functioning market where everyone has full information, there's no barriers of entry, everyone can, can have their choice. But if we imagine that other parts of the system are sticky, so that there's still large inequalities between schools, everyone can now want to try to put their kid into the, the best school, how then would you sort out that over, <laughs> over interest in, in everyone trying to put their kids into a stronger school, let's say, or one that has better teaching? So what does school choice working really mean? And then let's say you had that perfect kind of competition or that perfect market, um, how would you then make a secondary choice about something that's oversubscribed? So Caitlin and I both were actually high school teachers and we both taught in choice schools. We have over a decade of teaching experience in both charter and magnet schools in Indiana, Wisconsin, and California. And we would argue that our schools that we taught at had effective choice systems. We used demographic-based lotteries so that students were represented demographically in terms of race and socioeconomic status. We also, our schools did not have thresholds that required certain standardized test scores to attend our schools. And additionally, our schools had transportation accessible to any students in the district to attend those choice schools. And so we do believe that if done properly and if done well and certain measures are addressed, then yes, school choice can be beneficial for all students. However, in the state of Tennessee, as you've mentioned, there are school inequities. And I think that goes to our funding challenges because ultimately, currently what's happening is wealthy parents use choice to take funding outside of schools. 
especially the ones that are underachieving. However, if we use certain level levers that we mentioned, such as corporate sponsorships, to give all of those school resources to underperforming schools, then we aren't necessarily depending on wealthy parents to bring in additional donations and funding to those schools. So while it is a sticky mechanism, especially in the way that it currently works, we do believe that there are opportunities for levers to address it and fix it. Um, thank you very much. I would just like to focus on one specific thing that you mentioned about moving uh, high quality teaching from um, sort of the high economic status schools to the lower economic status schools, but you also mentioned a big problem with retention. Um, did you look at anything in the system that would improve retention of those good quality teachers? Yes, so absolutely. Funding is a huge part of teacher retention. The reason why there is such high levels of school turnover, of teacher turnover in low performing schools is because many of these teachers do not have the resources, be that classroom supplies for students who may not afford to bring their own notebooks, pencils, and pens to class, or a lack of professional development for teachers because all the resources in that school are dedicated to Band-Aid solutions for students who are in crisis. As a result, teachers who enter into these schools face very difficult circumstances. They don't have the resources or training necessary to uh, respond to the challenges they face, and as a result, they either drop out of teaching as a profession or they move on to a higher performing school where they don't have to deal with these same challenges. We believe that stipends are a way to incentivize teachers, at least in the short term, to uh, be attracted to these lower performing schools, to want to teach there. And we believe, hopefully in the long term, if we have more equitable funding, that these resource gaps can be resolved, where suddenly these teachers don't have to worry about paying out of their own pockets to buy notebooks and pencils for their students so that they can learn. They don't have to worry about being the only kind of counseling that a student who's undergone traumatic past from gun violence, from poverty, from homelessness, the only person that they can turn to. If those resources are provided in other parts of the school, all of a sudden they get to focus on what they love, which is teaching, and they will be resourced to do that effectively. So I just want to uh, say what an amazing technical analysis that you've all done. And I want to maybe, maybe just zoom in to the process that you went through and just ask a little bit around, through your engagement, through your methodology, how do you feel like you embrace the complexity and the messiness of the system rather than reducing it um, through your mapping? So just a little bit, if you can tell a little bit of narrative of that, because there's always a risk with systems mapping of to start to treat the system like a machine rather than a living system. So yeah. any reflections, that would be great. So we actually spent the first week the first few weeks of our project just thinking about all of the different stakeholders that we can list. As education policy students who all work in advocacy organizations, Juliana and I work at an organization that works on the state level. Caitlin is involved in a school board campaign and that she runs. Sam and Andrew are both involved with nonprofits. We really strived to draw out all of the stakeholders we could think about and then prioritize which ones we wanted to go to first. So ultimately that led us to speaking to legislators, to various nonprofits leaders that worked with parents, that worked with schools, that worked with corporations, and ultimately also students and teachers as well. And so it was very challenging in the beginning to think about how to best approach it because we feel that with schools, oftentimes people start with the student experience. But mapping is about really stepping back and looking at the broader picture. And so we had to push ourselves to not think just about the daily experiences that students face, but also just every single stakeholder that plays a role in the day-to-day -day process. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just want to say, um, yeah, I just want to find a bit more about the hearts bit that you talked about towards the end, because um, your recommendations are very um, logical and, and, and kind of cognitive. I'm really interested in what you found out in talking to people around the emotional and what they're deeply invested in that means things become stuck. Mm -hmm. The thing that we care very deeply about, perhaps more deeply than anything else, is the role that schools play in communities. Um, we believe that part of the reason why national schools are currently failing from a standpoint of equity is because we don't have the kind of community investment in the schools that we desire. I can tell a case study about a school called Buena Vista in Nashville. It was the first school to integrate. It, is, it was a beacon of kind of what was good about Nashville, the, a step in the right direction. One of these had closed in 2020 because it did not have enough students to fill its seats. Because parents who attended that school left to go to different neighborhoods 
to attend charter schools or to attend private schools. We think that that kind of disinvestment from schools as part of the community is what allows us to have such an inequitable system. We believe that having policies such as creating uh, community events, museum events, sports teams hosting events at schools is a way to frame uh, schools not just as a place where you send your child for eight hours a day to be educated, but a community center that everybody in a neighborhood can get behind. Um, we think that reframing the way that natural citizens look at schools is the first step to making them understand the importance of equity in education. We think that if we can change hearts as well as minds, that we can get people to care about the issues that we see here, the issues that we are trying to bring into our work, to our lives, uh, and we hope that other people can be as passionate as we are about this issue of equity in Nashville. Thank you very much, Vanderbilt University. Great job. Okay. Our next group that we have, unfortunately, could not join us in person today. Um, so the next. Thank you. So the next group we have presenting today, unfortunately, could not join us in person here in Oxford. Um, but however, they are on the Zoom at the moment. So, hello. <laughs> um, hello, Grinnell College. Um, sorry that you couldn't be with us here today, but congratulations on submitting your video presentation and making it into the top six. That's fantastic. So our next presentation is on human trafficking in a sum, and that will be Grinnell College. Um, and they're all going to be on Zoom, so they'll be able to answer any questions that you have uh, via the video link as well. So when we're ready, we can play their video. Thank you. Our research investigates the factors that make populations in Assam vulnerable to human trafficking networks operating in the state. With different forms of human trafficking prevalent in India, men, women and children of all ages and backgrounds can become victims of the crime. While investigating the trends underlying the trafficking networks across Assam, like most government reports and research articles, we identified women and children to be the main vulnerable groups for trafficking. However, we also noted that as the demand underlying each form of trafficking is different, different groups of individuals are targeted by traffickers. For example, while men and young boys are often trafficked to work as forced labor in insurgency camps and small businesses, women and young girls are trafficked for forced marriage, sexual exploitation in brothels, and domestic servitude in urban homes. While trafficking networks operate across India, Assam provides a distinct case study for human trafficking as it acts as both a source and transit point due to its location as the gateway to northeast India and its geographical proximity to neighboring countries. In addition to exposed geographical boundaries, factors like rampant poverty, continuous low conviction rate for traffickers, annual natural disasters, long-term insurgency and ethnic conflict increase the vulnerability of Assamese populations to human trafficking. Due to these existing and continuously evolving social trends in the state, it reports a high rate of out-migration due to which there are multiple opportunities for traffickers to exploit vulnerable populations. To understand a complex system like human trafficking, we realize that the behavior of the system cannot be known just by knowing the elements constituting it. Thus, using system thinking tools, we broke down our system into its basic components and then reassembled the components into a larger coherent web of interconnected factors. Moving from a microscopic to a bird's eye view, we discovered that the trafficking survivors' lived experiences, an integral knowledge base for dissecting the system, was missing from most of the pre-existing literature. To account for this gap and include survivors as equal stakeholders in the conversation around human trafficking in Assam, we collaborated with our team members' organization, Empower People, an NGO that works on the issue of bride trafficking in Assam. This enabled us to identify ethical and culturally appropriate lenses to understand and evaluate the issue through the experiential knowledge possessed by trafficking survivors. To understand the other knowledge systems existing in this space, we also undertook an extensive literature review of varied primary and secondary sources. 
From a systems map, we found that SMEs communities become vulnerable to human trafficking due to complex interactions between their economic, social, environmental, political, and institutional conditions that trap them in cycles of powerlessness and exploitation. With each subsystem spilling into each other, our systems map conveys countless stories of survivors that were caught in various cycles composed of different factors. During the annual floods, an SMEs farmer who lost his agricultural land without adequate government interventions was forced to find employment opportunities through dubious job agencies, while a young girl from a poor marginalized community without adequate educational structures or familial support system was lured to work in a different state to contribute to her family's earnings, but was instead married off to an older man in a destination state. By exploring the interconnections between each survival story and systems in place in Assam, we discover that instead of being a sudden act of violence, trafficking is a product of daily practices, cultural norms, and historical events that outwardly seem disconnected. By breaking down our systems map into its components, we determine that pervasive conditions of poverty, unemployment, gender discrimination, and breakdown of family structure due to natural disasters or conflict reinforce the vulnerable position of Assamese populations to human trafficking. Taking one step further, we identify that unless these factors are counted through gender equity practices, promotion of sustainable sources of livelihood, social welfare schemes, and awareness about physical and digital security, these communities will remain stuck in reinforcing cycles of vulnerability and powerlessness. The system of vulnerability to human trafficking is not solely based on the position of the Assamese community, but on the power structure that enables and abet traffickers to exploit these vulnerabilities. Studying the mental models, system structures, and behavior patterns employed by traffickers, we establish that beside the economic power imbalance between the traffickers and the trafficked and inadequate government policies, Traffickers are also enabled by consistent demand for trafficked individuals from rich destination states, many of which possess a low sex ratio. Entrenched patriarchy and a preference for male children in these destination states enables them to objectify and dehumanize trafficked individuals who commonly hail from historically oppressed communities that lack political and cultural power. By narrowing our lens through feedback loops, we identify two structural issues unique to Assam alienation of Northeast India on a national level and politicization of ethnicities within Assam that not only reinforce root causes of vulnerability to trafficking, but also enables traffickers. Inequitable policies like the Armed Forces Special Power Act and the Citizenship Amendment Act, coupled with lacking policies for countering poverty and unemployment, maintain the conditions of ethnic division, conflict and economic insecurity in Assam. Furthermore, undertaking resource extraction and employing a narrow notion of development that only benefits a few, the government perpetuates displacement, social tension, environmental degradation, and lack of trust in the government. Within these complex subsystems and power hierarchies, we identified a range of stakeholders that are involved in either mitigating or perpetuating human trafficking in Assam. It is important to recognize that due to the grey areas of the system, most of the stakeholders don't have a static role and keep moving between being enablers of trafficking and being change makers. For example, while the central and state government and judiciary bodies possess the most decision-making power, they inadvertently increase the vulnerability of SME's populations through incomprehensive legislation, weak judicial systems, and insufficient support to enforcement agencies. In this hierarchical model, while survivors are the key stakeholders and hold valuable experiential knowledge, their opinions and lived experiences are often sidelined by all institutional agents. This results from the social stigma attached to survivors which reduces their identity to the single event of trafficking and refuses to acknowledge them as agents of change. The central and state government, civil society organizations and international organizations have employed several solutions at the national, state and local level to counter the human trafficking networks in Assam. While these stakeholders have introduced innovative systemic solutions from establishing anti-human trafficking units across India, introducing child protection services, to operating counselling centres for survivors of human trafficking and their families, we identified various gaps hindering their effective implementation. Social stigma against trafficking survivors results in their exclusion from the solution development process and discourages the development of survivor-led advocacy groups or unions. To counter social stigma, it is crucial to acknowledge the worth and imagination of survivors in the policy-making process and develop solutions that promote their interests and welfare. For example, while many current policies targeted at prevention of human trafficking inhibit out-migration of local Assamese communities, they inadvertently obstruct the economic and social mobility of vulnerable individuals. 
Anti trafficking efforts led by enforcement agencies tend to be plagued by staff shortages, lack of training, and insufficient understanding of trafficking laws. Failure to fix this gap has resulted in weak prosecution, low conviction rates, and lack of confidence in reporting trafficking cases, all of which empowers traffickers to continue trafficking while limiting the ability of survivors to seek help. To address the lack of manpower and redressal mechanisms in anti trafficking efforts, it is pivotal to recognize the existing flaws in the current system. For example, as many police officers in the state are ingrained in the patriarchal system, they need periodic sensitivity training to deal with survivors and their families. Lack of collaboration and systematic planning between enforcement agencies and NGOs that engage in rescue and rehabilitation reduces anti-trafficking efforts to short-term interventions that fail to offer adequate security and protection to survivors. Instead, survivors are merely reduced to statistics and triumph cases, notions which tend to perpetuate the victimization and stigmatization faced by survivors. For instance, the Ujwala scheme, which is often co-managed by the government and NGOs and provides shelter to survivors after rescue, fails to ensure a secure home for survivors due to lack of maintenance and poor funding. Thus, enforcement agencies and NGOs need to identify that comprehensive anti-trafficking efforts would remain lacking without a concentrated effort to ensure wide-scale collaboration and coordination. Lastly, insufficient post-disaster and post-conflict rehabilitation policies and efforts open up vulnerable populations to traffickers who treat relief camps as their hunting grounds. A review of human trafficking records indicate that a majority of the victims hail from river island areas that are prone to flooding. Recognizing that these populations, displaced by natural disasters or conflict, are one of the main victims of trafficking can aid institutions in establishing disaster management policies that collaborate with anti-human trafficking cells. Dissecting the challenge landscape of the system of human trafficking was an eye-opening experience as it introduced us to various individual events that on the surface seem disconnected but could be traced back to the same systemic failures. For instance, due to unmaintained criminal records, underreporting by local police and lack of case registrations due to complex or inactive legal machinery, not only do agents in the system underestimate the extent of the trafficking crisis in the state but also disregard men and young boys from the narrative, which leads to one-sided solutions. Similarly, while building a solution landscape, we understood that to bring about systemic change, it is crucial to incorporate a long-term approach that focuses on histories, narratives, and vision rather than statistics. By adopting a similar approach to devise intervention opportunities, we identified that all agents involved in the system of human trafficking, including us as researchers, need to recognize the worth and knowledge of all the survivors and co-create programs, policies, and future research along with them to ensure that all solutions are grounded in the reality of human trafficking in Assam. Hi there, welcome and thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I had a question on, on some of the, your sort of solutions and, and suggestions. Some of them were sort of phrased in a way, you know, establish X or do this. And I was wondering if you could sort of specify a little bit more. So who should be <laughs> encouraging that change and who should be making the change. So who are these recommendations for, and, and tell us a little bit more about those, those actors. I think one of the main things when we were talking about establishing bodies is we recognize that uh, creating solutions which don't have a basis already is a very difficult solution to implement in real life. So when we me mentioned establishing bodies, what we meant was that there are already bodies like child protection schemes, which are there at a national level, at a state level, and a district level. But a lot of the times, because there are culturally differences in the state of Assam at local, uh, at individual and local levels, like the uh, block level or the village level, it would be better to establish those bodies at those localized states to ensure that the cultural nuances of each district, of each uh, town of each village is taken into account when these bodies are established. So one of the main things would be in that case, all that the government would have to do in this case is that civil uh, by uh, collaborating with civil society organizations that already play a role and with judiciary systems, they would just extend the mechanisms of the child protection schemes beyond the district level to localized level to make sure that this uh, expands beyond that. 
And just to elaborate on specific things, we talked about the Ojwala scheme, which provides shelter home to survivors after rescue. And in that scheme, uh, NGOs and let's say enforcement bodies often collaborate with each other to carry it out. Also, while carrying out rescue, the police tends to collaborate with NGOs to trace uh, networks of human trafficking. So these collaborations exist, but our focus is that it needs to be an effort that involves all of these stakeholders to identify where these sort of organizations needs need to be built and they should be doing it together. I think maybe another way to ask this question is what does it take to establish a body? How do you establish a body, right? Maybe tell me a little bit more about that. I think uh, this would be very interesting. So uh, when I was reading about the child protection schemes that were introduced in India, one of the main things is first, uh, the even like the question that you asked, I think that raises a big gap in our system that when they're trying to implement such bodies in India, one of the main things is when they try to recruit people. So it's usually child protection schemes have 12 members and uh, there is one head, of the, uh, one head who usually comes from either a judicial background or a law enforcement background so that they have adequate knowledge about the system, about the policies that are in place and other state laws that are in place. So usually uh, what would in, be incorporated in uh, establishing this at a taluka or a village level would be uh, getting people who are involved in the civil society organizations that are in place like NGOs that are uh, NGOs research organizations and having other people from the judicial system at the district legal services authority, which is already placed in every in Assam. So getting people from these to recruit people from this and then make a 12 body member would be something which would basically be the system for um, establishing such a body. And talking from a technical perspective, if you talk about uh, policy making, I think there needs to be an action plan that involves all of these stakeholders, of course. There could be government bodies that are being made, but civil society organizations, especially in remote areas, and as Purusha said, at village and block levels in Assam, play a huge role in already making some change. So there needs to be a collaborative action plan to sort of figure out who needs to do what. Hi there. Thanks so much. So this is a question that I, I could have asked any of the groups thus far, but I wanted, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you two on the spot and ask you to, so answer as best as you can. But I just have a, maybe a, 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 an open-ended question around collaborative diagnosis. And all the groups thus far, including yourself, have indicated that you've done interviews and then mapping. How might you actually involve those stakeholders in a collaborative diagnosis going forward, understanding that one of your core solutions is involving them in the solutions, but you know, this premise of nothing about us without us, how might you do that in the future? Yeah, yeah. The, way, the way we envision it is uh, usually social movements, there needs, the central actor in social movements need to be the one who affected the most. In this particular case, it would be survivors. So there needs to be a concentrated effort to foster survivor-led advocacy group or policy groups who can sort of lead that change and if we have survivors disrupting the system and going into a male dominated sphere of let's say administrative bureaucratic or government structures that in itself would create a lot of change. I think adding on to that. So uh, apart from an institutional level, um, when we were discussing, I think most of the uh, interviews with the stakeholders, it kind of brought this idea out that patriarchy just doesn't exist in the institutions, but it exists and is deeply entrenched within the society itself. So, may, so those advocacy groups, while they would be working within with the institutions, with the government, with the civil society organization to change their mandate, there need to be peer support groups within these uh, within the localized systems to make sure that the survivors together can understand each other's um, you know stories because that was one of the main. Uh, I think insights from our research that every story was very different because people came from different social backgrounds or, and, and I mean, there's a lot of focus on women and young girls and children in Assam. And when we talk about human trafficking, but a lot of, especially in this narrative, a lot of young boys and even men because bond, uh, trafficking for bonded labor is rapidly increasing in India. So a lot of the narrative sidelines that. So creating pure advocate groups where these people could get together, uh, understand each other's stories, helps it eradicating the social stigma at a much more community-based level. So that would be one of the things where they can directly uh, be involved. So maybe just as a follow-up, what is your sense 
around, say you showed this multi-causal loop diagram to those survivors on the ground or you showed your research, how do you think they would react? Do you think it would land for them and why or why not? So just a question around that. Something around validating your diagnosis, validating your systems maps with those most affected. I think um, when initially we were preparing this research and when we were using system thinking tools, that was one of the things I mentioned that um, it would be very difficult to, on, to, to be very honest, it would be very difficult to explain these diagrams or to get a hang of the ideas the way we have phrased them to that particular group because uh, when we were getting these ideas from them, a lot of our solutions have come directly from survivors and from other stakeholders who are working in the field. So when we directly were getting information from them, it's phrased in a very different way because they have different ideas of what system means of what social change means. So it is not easy. I mean, that's one of the main things like the idea of agency is something that we were able to recognize. And we hope that when uh, they look at our research, they are able to recognize the amount of agency that they have. They are able to recognize the power that they have to uh, influence someone to that level to create this research because I think for us, a large part of our research, we owe that to the kind of stories that we were able to get from them. So to, I think that would be my uh, takeaway from that, that when they look at our research, at least that they are able to see their agency, their power, their responsibility in creating more awareness about the issue right there on the paper. Because I don't think a lot of the system thinking tools would be something that would be implicitly understandable for a lot of these people because of the lack of education that is there, because of the lack of, uh, because the differences in understanding the differences in explaining these things. Just there's a big barrier. And I think that's from our side as well as from their side. And we've tried a lot during our interviews to make sure you know we were able to bridge that. And even looking at a system map, I think we've received feedback over time that it seems to be very huge. And why is that? It's because we've tried to accommodate every possible scenario we could think of and we heard in those stories. So that we hope that when potential survivors look at this map, they can situate themselves somewhere in between those five systems or anywhere in there. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Uh, could you share what you might do differently if you could do this over, knowing that you had set a boundary in your region and you were looking at different um, areas of trafficking, but now that you know what you know, if you had to do another one, do this over, what would you do differently? I think uh, if we had more resources, one of the main things that we would like to do would be directly uh, talking to people, I think in government institutions, because that was something that we were not able to do this time because of the lack of resources and because it's very difficult to reach out to them uh, at this level. So that would be something that we would definitely want to understand because right now, a lot of our uh, focus on the research was about vulnerability of these communities, talking to these survivors, but also considering that we have to take into account that the government, the civil society organizations, all of them play such an integral role. That would be something that we already were aware of, I think, but their decision-making power, the extent of it is something that we recognize much better now. So that would be something we want to understand. And hopefully if we were able to send something like this on their way, it would make a difference in how uh, they would also look at the system. I'm assuming. Yeah, and our project looks at one part, which is just, how these communities are vulnerable and how they get trafficked. There's also another aspect to it. After these people are rescued, there needs to be rehabilitation. And that's another system in itself that we would definitely want to look at because it's an important component of the entire problem of human trafficking. Um, and I must say, it was great to see your big smiley faces on the screen over there. So thank you so much for joining us. So we have one more presentation for today before we go into lunch. And the title of this presentation is Water is Life, Water Access in the Navajo Nation, North Dakota State University. Welcome. Shirt, yeah. Oh, I don't have a pocket. So yeah, it's like, put it like this. Is that okay? 
yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you can just put it in your pouch. Okay. You can just clip it on your shirt or your necklace. Okay, and then you can just put it on your belt. Anywhere you want in the front or the back. Yat eh, everybody, and yat eh, Bennett, everyone online. My name is Leonla. This is Abby. That's Tegan. That's Taylor. We are digging into water access in the Navajo Nation system. Uh, the Navajo Nation is the largest indigenous reservation located in the United States. Um, this topic is very personal for myself and Taylor, as we are from the Navajo Nation, specifically the Shibrock, New Mexico region. We are also, we also work in public health in our community um, and accessing water is a key component to our work. Um, we're gonna get started here to set the stage. We're going to learn about water access from a tribal member's experience. I am 65 years old and I've, I've been wanting water for a long time. I waited 30 years to get water here because of the rocky area we lived in. And when I got water, I was so happy. I could do my laundry. I could have hot water for my dishes. I didn't have to haul water for 10, 12 miles just to cook. So I, I've retired now and I'm happily living out here. Unfortunately, Gloria's story um, is a common one. It can be a very complex process for people to get piped water. The key stakeholders are NTUA, the only tribal utility company on Navajo, and NECA, the construction company who installs those systems. Another major player is IHS, who's a federal agency. Um, and they have a lot of power because they provide all the funding. The other part of the process is that tribal members have to prove blood quantum. They have to fill out the application, um, a paper application for land and get permission from neighbors who may or may not use the land for livestock use um, and other, um, other processes. And so all of these stars have to align for someone to get water. And unfortunately, for some people like Gloria, that process can take decades. While working through our stakeholders map and iceberg model, we quickly realized the complexity of our problem. So we simplified our map, showing only the root causes. And the main focal point is water access data, or rather the lack of. Direct impacts of this is a lack of awareness and understanding, shortfalls in culturally appropriate federal policies, and minimizing indigenous voices being heard. Together, these create a loop, driving old data and a faulty willpower to collect new data, consistently being circled among students, workers, and citizens. Recently, with the COVID-19 pandemic, funding was provided through the CARES Act in an attempt to help tribal communities. Unfortunately, due to the lack of collaboration and slight adequate information, this often resulted in short-term or Band-Aid solutions. Two examples of this would be plastic water bottles funded by the BIA or Bureau of Indian Affairs, as well as source hydrosolar panels, which stems from helicopter research. Helicopter research is a maladaptive practice where researchers observe, collect data, and drop off what they believe to be the necessary supplies to success. However, they neglect to educate and communicate with the communities. Uranium mines are also worth noting as about 40% of mines still continue to contaminate safe water since abandonment as of June 2022. We don't have running water because we live two and a half miles away from the nearest water line. 
and it was suggested by Intuway that we get a cistern system. And although we're looking forward to it because we'll have water coming into our home and coming out of the faucets, it will still require us to haul our own water, takes gas money, um, takes a lot of our time. We also don't know the quality of the water that's coming out of these water tanks. As you heard, the couple consistently spends both time and money on the basic necessity, water. So at the local level, there are a handful of organizations working diligently to combat water access issues. This includes Dig Deep, which is a nonprofit that installs off-grid cistern systems and uses solar panels, like Abby mentioned, to generate running water. Another key player is Navajo Nation um, Water Access Coordination Group, which is an interdepartmental agency that, through multiple data programs and safe water programs, is increasing access to water in tribal homes. Now, across the entire United States, piping water to rural and suburban Americans is no small feat. Oftentimes, the cost of a project will outweigh the amount of revenue that any private company would be able to generate from undertaking such a project. So you might ask, how do the majority of rural and suburban Americans have reliable and safe access to water? We can look to the 3,300 plus water cooperatives across the United States as a better solution for tackling rural access issues. Rather than private, profit-driven companies, nonprofit or um, cooperatives are not for profit, and they must follow a set of rules to maintain tax-exempt status. So this includes uh, providing water at cost, and as well, each uh, customer served by the water cooperative is a partial owner of the cooperative. So it is essentially member-owned, and the cooperative must listen to the needs and wants of those members. We can look to the Cheyenne River Reservation for an example of a successfully, su successful tribally owned water cooperative. With the help of the United States Department of Agriculture, Indian Health Services, and the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, the Mini Wash Day Water Company now serves over 14,000 members. Access to water is also a pervasive issue in Canada. To get a broader perspective on water access issues as a whole, we spoke to some representatives from Canadian nonprofits who work closely with Indigenous communities in Canada's far north. The focus of Water First is education, educating Indigenous youth and young adults so that they can see a place for themselves in water sciences and eventually pursue a career in water preservation or water operations. True North Aid is another NGO working with Canada's far north, and they have seen such good results from these programs that now all of their funding goes to them. A gap we have identified is limited community-based initiatives that talk and teach about water systems. Similar initiatives that Tegan mentioned, such as K-12 water program education initiatives um, and career training for young adults can be implemented on the Navajo Nation to promote local leadership and ownership of our own water systems. Um, and most importantly, these education initiatives can promote traditional Diné teachings that water is a living entity and therefore we respect it that way. Another prominent gap is the inconsistent data collection of tribal members' household water access situation. Um, previously, data collection has largely been by done by non-tribal, non-indigenous entities and therefore inaccurate data, inaccurate misinterpretations. Um, and this is a picture of Lianla, and she mentioned that we work in public health. Um, so this is her um, uh, testing a water sample. And so we understand and we know why it's important to work in our community and with our community. Um, and tribal members' water access, as mentioned in the, you saw in the videos, differ by living situation, um, status in the water service request process, and even personal preference. Um, some members live in really difficult geographic locations. Implementing not-for-water profit cooperatives that Tegan mentioned, um, operated by tribal members, can be a possible avenue for data collection and can even serve as our own data hubs. Concepts of indigenous data sovereignty to collect, own, and apply our own data at our own discretion will help to center the stories and experiences like our relatives, Gloria, Janelle, and Didi, and most importantly, emphasize areas of tribal policy that need to be implemented and updated and made more accessible for our own community members. So one of Abby and I's key insights was just the idea that a basic necessity such as water is a luxury for some. 
Having hot water to do your laundry with or clean water to wash your hands with during a pandemic is not often a thought that crosses our minds. Not only are we a team of indigenous and non-indigenous women, but we are also a team from two different countries, three different universities, and three different time zones, and yet we were still able to find a shared passion towards indigenous injustices and collaborate through storytelling and open-minded stories. As the Dinet team members, Leona and I really learned about the community levers, like the, the larger map that you saw, the first map, that really inhibit community members from getting water access. So there are certain tribal policies that are need to be updated. And even grazing permit holders, you know, they can have a say. And if they don't want a neighbor or someone to not have water or not to go through their land, then that's an immediate halt on um, requesting water services. So understanding all of these systems is critical. It's crucial to creating sustainable solutions for not just currently and our elders, but especially for our future generations who want to live on the Navajo Nation. Thank you for your time. kid. what questions do you have for us? Hi, thank you very much um, for your presentation. Really appreciate it and really appreciate um, both the lived experience but also that you've been able to come together, as you mentioned, from so many different places um, over a shared passion. So I'd like to just talk about that a little bit. How do you think that we can employ that and you know, sort of hold accountable our leaders um, to engage in partnerships like that? You mentioned you know, peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, you mentioned peer shared ownership in some of the solutions that you explored. So how can we make sure that we're upscaling those things uh, to create those sustainable solutions. I think in terms of collaboration and partnership with indigenous people from the communities, I think it really comes from, from the ally perspective of a lot of you in the room. It comes from your own true intention. Are you genuine about working with indigenous communities? Is that really you know, your intention of assisting or is it something of a savioristic complex? So I think it comes down to really checking yourself um, when it comes to collaboration. And in terms of ownership, feel free to add in, but I think it comes down to, we talked about community education initiatives and empowerment, um, dig deep. The example that we provided has done a really great job of employing Navajo Nation tribal members who work in certain communities and training them in installing water systems. And those again are certain areas of the Navajo Nation and I think doing that more um, throughout and not just with certain communities, that would be very helpful in giving that sense of ownership back to communities. There's 110 chapters, which are local governments on the Navajo Nation, so um, I think utilizing um, those areas um, and kind of implementing um, those community education initiatives could be a potential way of giving back that um, ownership. Um, thank you for that. I'm really curious to hear more about some of the biggest challenges or roadblocks that you felt you faced on the ground of the challenge. Um, you mentioned a little bit about uh, all the things you were able to overcome together as a team, but how about working with stakeholders? Um, so some of those major roadblocks and perhaps if there were any breakthroughs that uh, kind of sit with you still today as you look back on your research. We had talked with the Indian Health yeah. Service employee, um, which was really difficult, right, because there's so many stakeholders, and um, that was an interesting conversation because um, the, sorry, <laughs> apologies for that, um, because the, the work that we do, um, I think community members are very, can still be suspicious of the term research, and, you know, that's a huge, you know, talking about research with indigenous people, there's always that suspicion, which is rightly so. You know, not too long ago, forced sterilization of native women. Um, so I think it goes down to trying to understand the power dynamics a little bit more in each of these entities. Um, I think 
one thing we had wished is that you were full-time workers and part-time students add on top of this project. <laughs> um, we wish that there was more time to talk with people from tribal offices, and I think that is a certain power dynamic within itself. Um, the Navajo Nation is has a three-branch government, which is built off of or kind of um, based off of the U.S. government, which is not something that's not traditional, right? And so those certain power dynamics kind of go over into how can we talk effectively and communicate and reach out to some of these leaders. So I think that's something that's been a challenge. I think the other thing that's a challenge within this map is that all of these people have to work together and it, it's not as cohesive um, for them to communicate. So when we were doing our research and interviewing people and talking to them, they blame each other. <laughs> which is you know, pretty common. Um, so I think getting over that and figuring out a way um, to streamline communication and everyone getting on the same page is really important. And even recently there was um, in Utah, the water access in that area, it was an 18 year legal battle and you had to get the, the federal government, the state government, the Navajo Nation is across three different states three different governments between those states. So getting the federal involved, the state involved, and the tribal involved is something that doesn't happen very often. It's very difficult to do. So there was an 18-year legal battle, which was the legal aspect of it, but it was a problem, obviously, before then as well. Correct. And that was for uh, water rights in Utah portion only of the reservation. And you saw that it spans three states, so there's still <coughs> complexities within That's the other ones. The other problem is like it spans three states and of course each state has its own specific state government and then like Taylor mentioned there's over 110 around 110 chapter houses and they each have their own like governments and systems within them so there's just a lot of from small to big there's just a lot of people in between and it's hard to get everyone on the same page yep thing to add to that. Um, underneath all of that, you know, what Liana mentioned of blaming each other, and that's something that we have to recognize and everyone has to recognize is the larger play of colonialism and how it seeped into our own lateral oppression within our community. And I think that's something we cannot ignore and when understanding all of these systems. So I've got sort of a multi, multi-part question, and I'm actually glad you've got this slide up. So, so based on your, your research and your, your recommendations, how would this map look different if, if the interventions that you suggest were, were put into place? And particularly, you mentioned the role of policy, making policy changes. So wh where would they fit into that? Um, yeah, I'll ask that as the first part. I think I can start us okay. off. Um, Go ahead. Just, I'll just specifically talk about um, the cooperative aspect of this. So I think it's important to mention that NTUA is a for-profit for um, company, mm -hmm. and it's actually run by a non-tribal member. Um, and we kind of feel that this is potentially posing a problem, especially since it is the only utility company, same with the construction company, it's the only construction company on the Navajo Nation. This is a quarter of a million people that these two agencies are serving. and so. We really feel that a water cooperative um, would help to sort of bring back that ownership to the uh, community members themselves as cooperatives are innately like member owned. Um, you have a board of directors on a cooperative and the, um, every single customer within that cooperative gets a vote. So you get to elect your own representatives that you feel are going to represent what you uh, value, what your core values are. And so the map would probably look quite a bit different if that was in place because we wouldn't have just literally those two entities and that's it. We would have a lot more um, discussion, open discussion, collaboration and work and ownership within the individual communities themselves. So oh, if you were gonna sort of point out where it would go on the map or what linkages, can, can you sort of visualize it if you look almost behind you or I guess you, see, you can see it below. <laughs> Yeah, I think it would take place of the of Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. Like that would in sense be the water cooperative. And then the other policy measure would be the grazing permit holder consent. Um, so like if unfortunately if there is feuding or someone doesn't like each other and they would want to live next to each other, um, the grazing permit holder could really just say no 
I don't want them to have a water line going through where my cows or sheep graze. Um, so I think eliminating that grazing permit holder um, piece like that would potentially eliminate. That would cause a lot of discussion, for sure, with community members. And I think that's where it goes back to where we really need to have ways of incorporating our traditional teachings of eh and which is relationship and kinship. What does that really mean? How do we bring that back a little bit more in terms of things when it comes to water access? You guys want to go? Okay. You know, one thing that didn't come up, but I'm sure you guys talked about, is that this is happening in the context of global heating and climate emergency and all of that. So how have you taken into account sort of the long durée, the long term, and, and the future in, in when you're thinking about these, these solutions? I would say, so kind of overviewing currently, the hydrosolar panels that I mentioned, it's, um, it's a band-aid solution because there wasn't a, a collaboration in discussing the, the climate change. Not very many people do realize that it does get cold in the desert and there is a winter month and those systems are unable to function. And as climate change is happening, there's the, a rise in temperatures, there's more dust storms that are occurring and that dust gets into the particles of the, the hydrosolar panels and then breaks them. So finding a solution to where there's you know, more collaboration, there's, there's less blame with the, the cooperatives, people are communicating and going from there, yes. I don't know if you're familiar with Lake Powell, um, but you've clearly seen the pictures of the water levels rising. And that is the larger system of the Colorado River and um, the water, Colorado River water rights. Like that's a huge discussion um, for not just the Navajo Nation, but several tribes in the Arizona Colorado River region. Um, and I think that that discussion has been 18 years in the making and giving back those rights back to not just the Navajo Nation, but our tribe. And we have different viewpoints on water, obviously. And I think that, um, I think that incorporating that discussion is important in these, you know, we can't just build tons of pipelines coming off of the river for obvious reasons and geographic location of homes on mesas and valleys. Um, so I think that is very important to consider because that w the water levels are rising with climate change um, and no one is considering that and there's no one considering the indigenous voice in that as well. Kind of going off of the indigenous voice, some people don't necessarily realize that not every single person wants piped water. We watched a video where there was a family who lived on the reservation and then went to go move into the city in the apartments and realized, you know, this wasn't for me. They found it very weird that their bathroom was down the hall and not like in an outhouse. So then they ended up moving back to the reservation and they just, being so comfortable culturally, taking that adventure to go get water is something that they are comfortable with and they are satisfied with and it's not our right and the US government's right to just put in piped waters wherever they deem fit and if it's convenient for them, because it might not be convenient for the indigenous communities. Thank you so much, North Dakota State University. So we have had six presentations, which have been exceptional. Not only did they teach us more about the systems that they were exploring and provide us some in-depth analysis that we didn't have to go do ourselves, but that we can learn from, they also did an exceptional job presenting. And just to acknowledge that even though this is a very friendly and warm audience, it is not easy to stand on the stage and present, and you all did phenomenally well, so well done. We are also running perfectly on time, and we're about to go um, for lunch. But before we go for lunch, uh, we wanted to provide you the opportunity to decide who your own winner is as well. 
So as well as having our three top finalists that our judges will announce after lunch, there will also be an Audience Choice Award. So if you could go to www.mentimeter.com and use this code. Please vote for your favorite uh, presentation today or the one that made the most sense to you or even transformed your thinking. Challenging, insightful, your audience choice award. Hmm? We're not going to see the results now. We're going to see the results after lunch. Um, we're going to send that. We're going to share this on our WhatsApp groups as well. So some of our audiences um, online as well will also be able to to vote. So you'll get the results of this afterwards. Did you guys all get it? Can I move on? No. Okay. I love how dedicated you guys are. You're like, we don't want to be biased. <laughs> Very good, thank you. That's why you were selected. Okay. We also wanted your feedback on the global final. Um, and so if you want to take out your phones and take a picture of this uh, QR code, we're going to share this in our Bertha Educator and WhatsApp group as well. Um, there's three easy questions um, to ask. What did you really enjoy about the global final? Um, you know, what did you maybe not enjoy as much? And uh, what things would you like to do uh, different in the future? This just helps us with our planning of events. Um, it's been almost two years. We have been an exceptional team of 15 people delivering this event to you over the weekend. Um, but I always believe that feedback is a gift. Um, and so please give us the gift of uh, feedback today. Okay, so now we're also share this in the WhatsApp groups, like I said. We're going to go into lunch. We have scheduled an hour and a half for lunch just to give the judges enough time to deliberate. Um, if we do want you to come back earlier, we will send some messages in the WhatsApp group, so please don't go too far. Um, the earliest would come back would probably be 10 past 2 instead of half past 2. Um, so uh, keep an eye out on the WhatsApp group. Lunch is going to be served in the dining room, which is the same place that it was yesterday. If you're joining us today for the first time, just follow where everybody else is walking. I'm sure you'll find the dining room. Or follow the smell of the food as well. We're all very hungry now. Um, and we're also going to take a group photo as well um, during lunchtime. I think, where are we going to take the group photo, Claire? We're going to take the group photo in the amphitheater. Um, and so, shall we just meet there at 10 past 2? Would that be okay? I think it's easier, yes. I think the permissions on that might not be right. I'm seeing a lot of screens come up that say people don't have access to that. Oh, really? Oh, okay. All right. I shall fix that and reshare it a little bit later on. Thank you. Thank you. Feedback is a gift. Appreciate it. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be like, no one commented. What's going on? That's great. Okay, so let's meet in the amphitheater at 10 past 2. The amphitheater is, if you're standing in the courtyard and you're looking up, it's like a big round circle at the top on the roof uh, where we'll be able to fit everybody over there. So we'll see you at 10 past 2 in the amphitheater. Thank you very much.
Do you want to go do that over there? Welcome everybody. Welcome back. Can you hear me? Testing one, two, testing. Testing one, two. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can we put up the volume a little bit maybe? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes? Fantastic. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you had a lovely lunch. Um, that was like one of my favorite moments, seeing everybody together in a photo on the stairs up there. It was, yeah, it was beautiful. What a wonderful group of people. OK, so now after lunch, we have a few treats for you before we announce the winners, um, not just because we want to create a, um, a little bit of suspense before we go out. <laughs> Um, but because, um, actually I was talking to Liv today, and because when we're talking about complex data and difficult problems to understand, sometimes poetry and art can help us understand them in different ways and help us to emotionally connect to the work in different ways as well, which is really exciting. Um, so we have two performances for us. Um, the first one um, is from Liv Talk. Liv is a hot poet. Um, and she, I'll tell you why she's a hot poet. So she, uh, she fuses spoken word. Um, she works with improvised music, film, science, and bags of hopeful facts. The hot poets aim to change the doom narrative around climate change and shine many inspiring lights on the amazing work being done around the world. Um, so Liv is going to share her poem with us um, this afternoon. Pardon? Are you done? Wow. Oh. Congratulations. So the judges will be done, so we're going to be on time as well. Fantastic. Well, over to you, Liv. Thank you so much for being with us today. She's going to use her handout. Hello, hello. Can you hear me okay? I mean... Hi, I am Liv Talk, and I'm obviously a hot poet for many reasons. Um, that joke's been made all morning, I know, and you've ruined my joke for me. Um, are you all, it's quite exciting to be here. Who here is so nervous about the, what's the results that they're not going to be able to listen or concentrate at all to anything? You're not even listening now. Um, that's fine. That's fine. You're not, you know, that's, that's on you. But culture is important, right? So I, I'm here. I've, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Hot Poets and then I'm going to read you the poem that I wrote for the project. So I'm a poet and I'm a, also a producer and a project maker. Um, now, in June 2019, which was the last time we had a Gla Glastonbury Festival, was anyone there? Glast yes. Are you going to this one? <laughs> I, remember, I was there too. I'm not going to be at this one, sadly. But I was in a muddy field in Glastonbury listening to dystopian doom poetry about climate change. And it left me and the thousands of people watching sinking further into the mud. Now, luckily at the time, I was with my very good friend, poet and performer, Chris Redmond, who told me that he'd recently been approached after a gig by Dr. Mikhail Nachmani from the London School of Economics. Now, who was, she was at the time in charge of the world database for the most polluting companies, which is a pretty big job, isn't it? And um, it was her job to convince shareholders to stop investing in fossil fuels and start investing in renewables. And when Chris asked Mikhail how that was going, expecting the answer to be bad, she said, better than we ever thought possible. Now, that's not an answer we're used to hearing, is it? Mikhail went on to explain the huge challenge the incredible minds at the London School of Economics and around the world ha were experiencing writing papers about climate action and solutions that the media never even see, let alone report. Now, just before Glastonbury Festival, I had released a poem called The Human Emergency that was my response as a mother of two young children to the constant doomsday clock climate of fear and grief that was leaving parents and everyone paralysed. Now, the poem didn't just get a lot of views. 
it went viral. But more importantly, it was a catalyst for action. It got used in protests in Australia and Philadelphia. It was aired to climate psychologists here at Oxford University. And it, um, so armed with the success of the human emergency and support from Mikkel, who came on board as our chief scientist, Chris and I man manifested the project Hot Poets, which is a project about powerfully communicating climate change science and action through spoken word poetry, the real stories of ingenuity and hope that we don't get to hear. Now, we match 12, and you can't see them here because it's really small, but I do have books, if you fancy, coming up to me afterwards. We match 12 of the UK's leading spoken word artists um, with 12 organisations on the front lines of climate change, including the Met Office, the London School of Economics, the RSPB, the Whale and Dolphin Foundation... Um, and all of the poets were tasked with creating a scientifically accurate, accessible and engaging poem about the work of our partner organisation, which were all professionally filmed and released one a day throughout COP26. And thanks to the Met Office, we, me and Chris got invited to go to COP26, which was very exciting. Um, and we performed our poems and talked about the project um, at the United Nations Resilience Pavilion and also on the Science Pavilion to politicians, scientists and UN delegates. Um, now, the Hot Poets films have now been seen over 150,000 times online and thousands of times in live performance as well. Um, we've also created an online participation program exploring, poetically exploring new sparks and inventions from around the world. The response we've had to this project has solidified in me a belief that poetry and spoken word can go further, deeper, more imaginatively into the climate change fight. That it can have real impact and engage more people more positively. That it can change useless despair into agency and action. For my poem, I was paired with Somerset Wildlife Trust and Somerset County Council. Um, I live in Somerset. And um, Somerset you probably may or may not know, a third of Somerset is below sea level. Um, and it's going to be one of the first, it already is one of the first areas in the UK, here in the global north, which is directly impacted by rising sea le levels and river flooding. Um, so there's an amazing project called Adapting the Levels, which is looking at ways they can sort of support communities, move communities, um, change r sort of the whole landscape so that it can be kind of protected against what's coming. Um, so I'm going to perform that poem now. Are you ready for a poem? Yeah. yeah. That's that's good, yeah. You haven't heard it yet. Um, <laughs> but it was my honour. I went, I went walking across the Somerset levels. They've got an amazing thing. You take, your, you take the app and it stops you at different places and you watch little videos and it shows you what they're doing all over the place um, to, to make changes. And I spoke to loads of people and I had like hours and hours worth of information and I had to put it into one poem, which seems to be what I have to do all the time. So this is when you know the water's coming. When I was a kid, I loved mucking about in rivers, balancing on rocks, holding my socks, playing poo sticks over rusty bridges, cheering on my soggy steed as it got tangled up in ragwort weed. In Somerset, where I live now, we know the water's coming. We are climate canaries, ever-changing, writhing eels, waiting for the day of mass migration when our childhood playground will rise up to reclaim the summer lands which we have borrowed from the sea. Every winter, to remind us, the sky falls down, to paint the fields with its reflection, a mirror for the moon to check her smile in before she blows a wobbly kiss up the Bristol Channel to the shore, into the plastic playground at Atlanta's door. Yes, we are all waiting for Poseidon's knock. We are a world waiting, with our hearts and sandbags breaking. Centuries ago, my ancestors tried to shape this land, changed the course of the parrot and the brew, built their banks and edges higher than the hedges, peeled back the soil to reveal the decomposing teeth of bare peat, and now belching out enough carbon to swallow the sky. On the high ground above Avalon, scientists gather like storm clouds, magicians of the Mendits with their sand trays and soil samples, leading by reason and example, raising their weather vane fingers to predict the coming floods. 
In their minds, they see the waters crest the Quantocks, charge down streets and over doorsteps, swamping sitting rooms and sofas in a tide of pesticides and other people's floaters. But any good magician knows, if you want to stop a wall of water in its tracks, you need to learn the science and adapt, raise the table off the stage um, and take with it the water too, 10 inches, give or take a few. And I've just closed my book, so I'm just going to... This is a, what we call a happy pause. Well, you, you realise that there's books that you can buy off me later. Um, 10 inches, give or take a few. I apologise to the video there for the pause. You can edit this out. Um, I'm so beyond worrying about this sort of stuff now. Um... Oh God, how embarrassing. I'm so embarrassed. Um. <laughs> but any good magician knows, if you want to stop a wall of water in its tracks, you have to learn the science and adapt. Raise the table off the stage and take with it the water too. Ten inches, give or take a few. Enough to soak the bone dust fields and keep the carbon underneath concealed. Reconnect the rivers to their natural drains, the old flood plains. Plant trees along the hills like sponges, horizontal hedges, leaky dams. Then build higher sea defences to teach our mouths more future tenses. Lead the farmers of our oldest ways to follow the carbon carrot through the Brexit blight to become climate guardians in this fight. Restore, rewind, rewild the rivers. Learn their primeval names and secret ways. For any kid with a bucket of elvers knows the earth's deep currents can't be tamed. So yes, save our towns, villages and sofas. But first... Reclaim the river's song. Because trying to control these ancient waters is where we first went wrong. For the summer people never really owned the levels. And now, before the climate tips, we must prove we still belong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liv. That was amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so next we have uh, Zuhura Plummer. Um, so Zuhura is a graphic illustrator and a live drawer. Um, she's worked at the Skull Center for a number of years, um, and I'm really glad we discovered her about three years. We've been together now. Um, so while those of you, the top six teams were presenting, so who was sitting in the corner there scribbling, and she, what she's done is she's made you all a um, visual representation of your presentations today um, as a way to summarize the work that you've done, um, and then she'll take these back and work on them a little bit more, um, and then you'll, you'll get them as teams. So over to you, Zahura. Hello everyone. Yes, yeah, so as Bronwyn says, I'm Zahora and I'm a graphic recorder. So I get the complete privilege of coming to these kinds of events a lot and listening to all these amazing ideas. Um, and I absolutely love doing this, by the way. This is like the best gig ever because um, I get to hear from you guys. And it's just so incredibly inspiring. And I was actually slightly in tears a little bit while I was drawing it how amazing the energy was with um, all the innovation and love and empathy in the room. Um, so I'm going to talk you through um, the pictures very quickly. They are by no means complete. So there was a lot of information. And obviously, I didn't record like every single thing that every person said and every part of the PowerPoint slides. So um, it's just really what just went through my brain and out of my hand in that moment. Um, it's a lot of writing because it's so fast, um, but they will be worked on and the teams will receive them. And please do come up to me if you see any actual errors, like factual errors in them. And also, I do welcome spelling mistake corrections because I'm a terrible speller, which is a real problem in this job. 
<laughs> um, so this one was the first one, amazing um, roadblocks to sustainable palm oil production in Indonesia. So um, we have over here a palm oil tree and around a big banner that says it's highly, highly lucrative. And that seems to be a very big issue, kind of foundation at the point of it. It's a huge um, part of the Indonesian economy. It's 59% of the world's supply of palm oil and 4.2 million people employed. Um, the team broke down into four um, areas, the kind of problems, um, government, economic, social, and environmental very clearly. So I captured those. Um, and then we had the spanner, which is like the lever of change over here in the corner. And so this is about all the different kinds of solutions and levers that the um, team talked about. So continuing to raise awareness and consumers ultimately having quite a lot of um, influence. Targeted support to farmers, particularly for certification um, and involving farmers in government agencies. So surprise, surprise, if you involve people in things, it tends to work out better. And then joint audits and agreements on certification principles. So it was a really, um, yeah, it was a really clear run through of those kind of issues. And then in the center is what an actual palm oil um, fruit looks like, seed, nut, uh, and then a bottle of palm oil. So it's just a nice little tree to seed to, um, to oil illustration. And then we have, in the shadow of the pandemic, uh, domestic, spousal domestic violence faced by women in Karnataka. So um, here is India, and Karnataka is highlighted so that everyone knows kind of roughly where it is because it's a big place with lots of different states. Um, though it came across really, really clearly from the team that um, how, how normalized domestic violence is and how there's a very strong kind of cultural and social norms around women as property and obedience being very, very highly valued. The team had time to quickly talk a little bit about why women don't leave or often end up going back. Um, so to do with courts, to do with shelter stays, to do with being divorced. Um, and then how COVID made that kind of exacerbated it all with like physical closeness and, and losing jobs and things like this. And then they had some very clear um, ideas for change, um, which sort of roughly fell into four categories. So I did the kind of hand with the four colours. So there was reform of the criminal justice system and then change of marital um, law around, uh, change of law around marital rape, which was, so that's a kind of... Um, law section and then there was a very clear like suggestion around reducing the number of digits for the phone uh, so when you're calling up to report it to make it very very quick and then there was a very strong one about um, teaching tra teacher training and sec good sex education in schools um, and then again answering the kind of um, the pinkness around the around the state of Karnataka or the the social Norms is a lot about having a new narrative around creating like a new thing around social in the media and in religion. Um, so that's a very, and but there was a really positive note that it kind of ended on that reporting is rising. So that does suggest that people are seeing it as a problem and reporting it. So that's a really, that's kind of really positive step forward. Um, then we have the South African one. So this is kind of hopefully a good depiction of a kind of n not like regular South African home for the people in the missing middle. Um, so not your kind of very high end like uh, fancy houses and not the kind of um, government supported or like very, very poor housing, but that kind of missing, that real missing middle came across really strongly in that presentation. Um, so there was a lot of um, really useful information and, and um, context about how apartheid era structures led to kind of risk and mortgage risk being racially profiled and there was actual geography in terms of like apartheid moving people around the country. Um, and then there's a lot of, um, but also house prices just completely rising, like jumping. Uh, some various problems are at poor administration, weak accountability, poor credit information, but also like a really big thing on mistrust of incentives. There's been a lot of government incentives over the years and people kind of understandably have a sense of mistrust around them. Um, but there were some strong solutions as well. Um, so in um, political protest remaining really vital in South Africa, lots of policy reform and regulation. And um, a key one was this innovative risk sharing public private partnerships. And there was a real lack of like intermediaries and contextual research and like knowledge about specifically like the South African housing issue um, in particular. And then ESG and impact link financing, which is slightly above my pay grade. I don't quite know what ESG stands for, but I wrote it down. 
Um, <laughs> and then this one was the Tennessee, uh, Nashville, Tennessee one. So we have your typical American like school and typical American school bus, which I don't know if it's true or not, but I had to draw something that looked like an American school. Um, <laughs> and so it's a boom town. It's, going, it's got loads of stuff going on there. It's great. But there's a very high um, incidence of educational inequality, and this is highly correlated or causated with race. Um, so it came across really, really strongly that segregated housing leads to segregated schools, leads to segregated housing, leads to segregated schools, and it's a kind of um, infinity loop going on here. And there's lots of reasons for that to do with right, historical reasons and loans and mortgages and white flight, um, but so well-segregated, um, well-resourced parents lead to well-resourced schools, unsurprisingly again. Uh, but there were some really clear policy recommendations and levers for change, which was a really clear and good website on using this universal choice. Oh, yes, yeah, so the city has universal choice. So that's written across the top of the school buildings and the school bus. So supposed universal choice, but actually, in reality, it's like highly, highly restricted because of things like social norms and feelings of belonging and feelings like different schools are for you or not for you. Um, and then also really practical things like transport, like that story about came across about that. Um, girl who had to drive across town and pay $20 a day for parking. Um, so, really good website on actually using that choice and like making that choice. Uh, stipends for teachers in poorer schools. Um, reform of housing policies, obviously a massive one, but sounds like it's pretty essential. And then a lot of stuff around corporate help and internships and um, career pathways so that people can actually get out of the system and hopefully give back at some point. Um, then we had human trafficking and Assam in India. So again, I drew another map of India because again, I think it's just really important for people to realize that like how big the country is and how far away the different states are. Um, so this is almost about as far away from Karnataka, I think, as you can really physically get. Um, so there was lots of um, different types of trafficking that I captured up there in the top corner. Um, and then I just put around the edge of this of um, the country, the things that make kind of um, Assam in that, a place that makes trafficking particularly tricky. So lots and lots of international borders, quite a lot of conflict and a lot of natural disasters. Um, they had this really nice um, thing which I picked up on, which was about analyzing from like the very, very micro level from a person down here, right up until the bird's eye view. So the, from the very micro to the macro. Um, and then there was the, the the lenses that they looked at here, uh, social, economic, political, environmental, and institutional. Um, they also talked a lot about how enablers also equal change agents. So those people who are, who are creating barriers are also those who could create change and vice versa. So that I have that running along the bottom as like a kind of foundational thing. And then there was some really specific stuff, again, involving survivors um, in policy making and advocacy, localizing child protection schemes, capacity, building capacity and training for law enforcement, um, and lots of stuff around data sharing and transparency between government and NGO actors. But one of the key messages that they really talked about was this focus on history and narratives and really kind of changing that. So I kind of highlighted that in yellow along there, which you can't really see because the Zoom thingy is there. But that was that one. And then um, this is a beautiful, the, the water is life um, access um, in the Navajo Nation. Uh, so we have a water truck and a water tower um, in the center of the page. And then this thing along here is the um, necklace that one of the team members was wearing. So it was my very quick um, drawing of um, the beautiful necklace. Um, so we have over here again, like generally speaking, the problems are over on that side and the solutions are on that side. Um, so they built like a very clear picture of like the complexity of well, just how complex the, it is. So I put the darker stuff is like the long term or like foundational things. And then the lighter blue is slightly more slightly more surface level type stuff. So water access data and indigenous voices not being heard, but then behind it there's lots of power dynamics, federal policy, climate change. And again, this mistrust, this thing about people who've been marginalized for years and years and years, then having a mistrust of like, you know, initiatives kind of understandably, but then that leading into like a perfect storm of not being able to tackle things. 
Um, and the complexity, again, of like 110 Navajo chapters, all individual chapters across three federal states. So it felt like a, it did feel like quite a, a map, a complex map. And I thought it was really interesting they put a landscape behind it because it kind of suggested the sense of space and scale that you're talking about as well. Um, so they talked a lot about co-op, water co-ops, uh, some being member owned and provision at cost. So those seem to be like the two foundational principles of the water co-ops. Um, we talked a bit about learning from Canada. Again, so that was really interesting. Put Canada up there in red, because Canada's red. Um, and then, <laughs> um, so tribally owned water co-ops seem to be like the main solution that they were proposing. Um, a lot around education and feeling like water skills were for the Navajo people. Um, an update to tribal policies and a lot of more of like peer support or peer cooperation and, and kind of remembering that. Um, and then there was a beautiful piece of writing which I, I think means water is life, um, which I took from there. And then this bit in the bottom corner is just a nice, I think it was in the Q&A, but um, somebody asked about how the team worked together and it came across really nicely that like with genuine intentions and shared passions, they kind of created a, a flowing, beautiful team. So it's all kind of watery, watery colors. Um, oh, and I haven't, oh, I haven't got faith to talk. I've got faith to talk on my thing, but not on the screen. No, 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 no. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yes, I have got faith to talk. Whoo, phew. Two minutes, two minutes. So, Faith's talk. Okay, it's not quite finished. You're seeing it with the grid. Sorry. Okay, so um, Faith gave this like beautiful talk this morning. Um, and I got loads of quotes because she just said so many things that were just like, I just want to capture exactly what she said. Um, so, what is a really beautiful one. It's hard to wake up with hope, but you give me hope. I feel like I've joined a new group of allies. So, I put that one up there. And then... Um, there was a big thing about how and what, like why child marriage happens. So she came across, she, she made it very, very clear about the desperation and like the social exclusion and the like very, very extreme poverty that people are facing and fear and the need to hold on to identity. Um, and they put that with the Indian couple down there. Um, that was their um, Girls Not Brides like vision. We envisage a world where girls, girls choose who, when and if they marry, so this is the pink and yellow down here. And then I really, um, she said something really powerful about education. There are a few silver bullets in the world, but education is about as, comes about as close as, as there is. Uh, so that's down there, which you, is, again, it's a little bit hidden. Um, so I've got an African couple, um, Indian couple and then an African girl. And then 23 girls married every minute, but it isn't just, it's also in the UK and the US. Like until recently, we had laws in the UK to get married at 16. So that's just like a quick overview of faiths as well. Sure, why not? Thank you, Zahura. Um, that was awesome, and, and thank you, Liv, as well. Hashtag hot poets. Sign me up for a book, by the way. Um, it was awesome. It's a, it's a great reminder that um, a big part of what we do is storytelling, right? You've dug really, really deep into these very complex systems, uh, but the only way forward is to be able to be able to communicate your insights in a way that are accessible to people. And that's something also that Zuhura um, does so brilliantly is that she's a visual storyteller. And so thank you for creating those things and for sharing that with us. And what a wonderful gift um, to, to have for all of the finalist teams. And you know, you see themes coming across all these very different projects in very different geographies as well. Um, and no, there was no one single intervention for any of you, right? There were these different intervention points and there's role for business and there's role for government, there's role for civil society and communities and oftentimes all of those working together. So just brilliant. Um, I'm so pleased now, we can put them up on screen, um, to introduce uh, my new boss, um, the dean of Said Business School, um, uh, Professor Sumitra Dutta. Um, Sumitra has just joined, uh, in fact, just less, about two weeks ago, in fact, he is so new that he's not here yet. Uh, 
because even if you're the dean of a major business school, it's hard to get a visa in the UK, or at least it's slow. And um, so he's still at home in the US, uh, but is, he would have been with us this weekend, of course, and has been watching along through the course of the brilliant presentations today. Um, I won't give you a lot of background, but Sumitra is coming to us from Cornell, uh, where he was professor, and then previous to that was actually the founding dean of the uh, Johnson Business School there. Has had a prolific career. I just want to highlight a couple of things about Sumitra's experience and his scholarship and innovation. The first is that he's the chair of the Global Business School Network, GBSN, who are partners of ours and that we are members of. And several of our university partners here today are part of the GBSN as well. It's a wonderful network of business schools all around the world. We hope to have lots more GBSN partners here in the future. Um, and that second, amongst his many books and articles that he's published, um, one of his earlier books, a kind of the dawn of the social networking age, has, I think, the best title of any business book that I've ever seen. It's called Throwing Sheep in the Boardroom. And to figure out what that means, you'll have to read the book. Um, but we are thrilled um, to have Sumitra's support and to have him with us today. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Peter, thank you so much, everyone, for, I think, for being there. I'm really, very sorry that I cannot join you in person, but I have been sort of watching and listening to some of the presentations, and certainly, I think the visuals presented by Zahura was very, very good summary for me of all the different wonderful presentations. So, you know, I would like to begin by just, of course, thanking all of you, mainly, you know, the students and educators, you know, the faculty colleagues and other staff members in the various partner institutions who have come together to create this very unique event. Uh, I do think that this event is something that we all need today. I think this is uh, more or less necessary today. And, uh, you know, I was last week in another climate event. And now there's the many of these events around the climate. And what was interesting was the mood in that meeting was so much more depressing and you know the general feeling was the classical feeling of you know things are getting so bad and what can we do and so on and in contrast I must say that uh, you know looking at other presentation summaries out here and the mood in this meeting certainly is much more of hope hope in terms of finding solutions hope in terms of uh, what the young people, you know, the people, the future belongs to you, the young students and the many young participants in this program, what you can actually create in the future. And we, in fact, rely on you, your leadership to help create a better future for yourself and for the future generations. You know, in many ways, I think my generation really has not done a very good job with the environment and with many other global problems we're facing right now. And in some sense, you know, we owe it to you to be able to provide the best support that you need to be able to create solutions for the future. Now, you know, when I talk to students, especially, you know, young leaders like yourself, I always like to, of course, remind you that you are extremely privileged. So, you know, in some sense, uh, you're very privileged to be part of these unique institutions where you belong. Uh, to be able to access this wonderful education that you have received, to be able to network with all the great colleagues and peers that you meet around the world, including in this kind of an event. And I think it's very important that you all realize and appreciate really truly how privileged you are. In some sense, and now I know there'll be winners announced out here, but all of you are winners. Now you have won. You have won. But along with this notion of privilege and winning comes a very important another side of the phenomena, which is responsibility. I think you are all individually and collectively responsible for creating a better future. And the reason why this is important is because most of you, okay, most of you will end up in very important, impactful careers, whether in government or in social enterprises or in private enterprises. And in those roles, you know, the decisions that you will make will influence the lives of many, in some cases, thousands. And I think it is very important that you realize that those decisions that you will make will change the course of the future for many around you and sometimes for entire nations as a whole. So I think that's a very unique, you know, possibility of impact that you have today. 
by virtue of who you are and where you have reached based on your own talents. And I think please carry that mantle of responsibility in as best a manner as possible as you go ahead. So clearly, you know, there will be some winners out here in this competition. Congratulations to them. But I think all of you are winners in many different ways. And I think as the final word, what I'd like to just say is be inspired, you know, be inspired by, you know, what you have heard and learned, be inspired by others around you and be inspired to go and make positive change in the world around us. Because we need you, you know, if you don't actually deliver, you know, in some sense, don't be as ineffective as my generation has been. I think you have to do better. In many ways, I think we really are counting on to do better. So thank you very much once again for including me uh, in this presentation. I look forward to just seeing the next part of the, uh, of the, of the, process, of the procedures. And uh, I wish you all the very best, you know, in your personal careers, in how you lead your lives on a personal basis, in a professional impact that you will make. And do keep in touch with the various friends you have made in this uh, event and at Oxford. And of course, uh, you know, thanks once again to the Skull Center, which really is a jewel in the crown for Side School. Thank you very much, Peter. Back to you. Um, thank you, Sumitra, for, for your message. And you echoed uh, live from the hot poets who exist also to remember that even though the challenge we face are so daunting and sometimes so depressing, all we can really do is face it with, with hope and courage. And it's this kind of community, as we heard about from Faith also this morning, um, that we can lean on each other. And that's what, that's what keeps us going. And, and thank you also for, for your call to action. Um, that you know, our actions, all of us, all of you in these next several years are gonna determine the future of, um, of everything, really. So it, it is a big responsibility and we appreciate that and we hope to see many of you in Oxford again. And of course, Sumitra, we hope that uh, uh, you will be here handing out certificates uh, at this time next year. Um, so uh, be well, of course, you'll be joining us for the award giving now and without further ado, I think we should get to that. Um, so once again, round of applause for Sumitra. Okay, so it's now time for some prize giving. Um, judges are welcome to come up and help give out awards. Um, we're gonna do the excellence awards and then um, uh, the, the other awards as well. Um, so why don't you all come up on stage, come around this way. Someone like to say something now or before we give out the prizes? Do you have a spokesperson? We have a spokesperson. Okay. Yeah. If you want to share stuff, share first, and then we'll give out the awards. Or do you want to do that before the? Should we just say thank you to everybody? Yeah. Okay. So you line up here. Okay, so before we give out the awards, let's just welcome back at least a, a subset of our final judges representing the rest of the group. They've worked so hard um, over several days reviewing the reports uh, even before you got here and everything since. So first, please round of applause to our judges. One, one of my favorite things about this competition is that I can't judge because it would be a conflict of interest and so I just get to come and have fun and you have to do all the hard work. Um, so I just want to ask if um, uh, one or some of you would just like to share any general reflections on what you've seen, heard, learned over the weekend. Um, thank you. I uh, just want to start by saying thank you to everyone. Um, you know, I haven't been on this stage since I competed myself in Map the System in 2018, so it's a bit of a weird moment for me. But actually, the caliber of what we've seen over the weekend uh, has been absolutely spectacular. We recognize how much work each and every team has put into this, and we're really grateful for everything that you've taught us. Um, we're really grateful to have been able to learn with you. Um, and what I would say is this is just the beginning. That's a reflection that I think you've heard from a few people 
people, but as someone who was part of this process, I continued that process after. So the people around you, the people beside you, that is your network. Those are the people you will lean on to take this stuff forward. So I think now, later, when the dust has settled a little, draw yourself and your solutions landscape because you are now part of that solution and you have both the privilege and the responsibility to, to be so. So thank you very much. Yeah, we just wanted to echo that and say and recognize how much time, heart, effort everyone has put into it, um, into the efforts. I've also done Map the System in the past, and so really understand how um, deeply you are in the in those challenges, walking with the stakeholders, walking with the actors that you've been working with. Um, I wanted to acknowledge also a lot of the humility that we saw in um, the submissions and being able to look at the human perspective, which I think when we're thinking about systems mapping and there's lots of dynamics, there's lots of components and a lot of logical thinking, a lot of analysis, but we've also seen that complemented by making sure that we're keeping the human story as a part of it. So the breadth and the depth of the work that all of you have done and all the teams have done. Uh, we feel so privileged to have learned that and given a platform um, through school to be able to share these learnings. So we hope that you have gained a lot from it and thank you for trusting us and um, walking with, with us through this journey. Thank you very much. Okay, so here's how this is going to work. Bear with me. Before we get into the audience award and the judged prizes, we have the excellence awards, as we mentioned yesterday. And, um, and this is um, something that we, we started this year in order to recognize excellence in different areas, um, you know, outside of the kind of overall. And, uh, and the judges also made these decisions, and we gave them five categories um, of excellence awards. And uh, just maybe as a sign of the high standard of work from all of you, not just today, but all weekends, um, there are more than five um, awards in total. So for some of these, there are gonna be multiple awardees. So what I'm gonna do is announce the category, and I'm gonna announce uh, the Excellence Award winners for those categories, um, and then all of you can come down and receive your certificate. We'll do a quick photo, we'll announce the next one, just to kind of keep things moving. So, the first category is highly commended. Um, this is effectively honorable mention. These are for really outstanding projects um, that uh, you know deserve on their merits recognition, um, and so the highly commended Excellence Awards go to uh, four teams. African Leadership University. Yeah. University of British Columbia. Yeah. University of Leeds. Yeah. And Wesleyan University. Please come on down if you're here. If you're here, come on down. We've got a certificate for you. ALU, if you're online, we love you. Congratulations. I'll see you in Kigali soon. Hey. University of Leeds. Of Leeds, there you are. Thank you very much. Leeds as well. Oh, there's one certificate per team. Um, you know, you come, come and do photos. Wesleyan, there you go. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay, everyone crowd in. One big photo. Crowd in, crowd in, crowd in. Thank you. Congratulations. You can go either way. Thank you. Get off the stage. You're done. <laughs> okay. Next. Next is the individual award. What do you want to get this out? Um, so the individual award is what it sounds like. It's to a team that was actually an individual um, who did all this work by him or herself and did an outstanding job well enough to be here and be part of this extraordinary group. Um, so the individual award goes to? Esiade Business School. Esiade Business School. Come here. Put an 
downstairs. This is the collaboration award. Okay. I'll explain it, then you can announce it. Come, 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 come. This way? Where, what are we doing? Okay. Okay. You want us over by those signs? Okay. okay. Fair enough. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Next, come on over. Come on over. Sorry, we hadn't quite choreographed all of this. We're gonna take the pictures over here. The next excellence awards are the collaboration awards. These are recognizing outstanding collaboration, particularly with teams engaging with the community, particularly uh, uh, recognizing the importance of lived experience and diverse perspectives as part of any systems work. And we have, I believe, four awardees for the collaboration award. Royson? photos? No. no, not really. Okay. <laughs> You're like whatever. <laughs> I know. Hey. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. 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 Well done. Everybody keep sliding down. Uh, the Oxford team. So oh, there you are. There they are. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Proud of your mommy. Yeah, she did great. <laughs> Woo! Wait, hold, hold for one more. All right. Uh, newcomer. newcomer, the Newcomer Awards. So the Newcomer Awards recognize teams representing uh, universities that are part of Map the System for the first time. Uh, you know, we know that it's a big lift um, in the first year, particularly for educators. It's a complex program and process, um, and we all get better with age, just like a good bottle of wine. And so for, the, for those who are part of new institutions, it's really an achievement to be uh, where you are. And we have three Newcomer Awards. You want to read them off, Tanya? Sure. First, we have the National Economics University. <laughs> Second, we have the University of Utah. <laughs> Just say Brussels. <laughs> University of Brussels. She didn't want to butcher it. Please come on down if you're here. Yes. Uh, National What's Economics that? University is online. Uh huh. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Congrats. Yeah, yeah. Well done. Thank you. Congratulations. I know we, we, she didn't want to read it. No. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. University of Brussels. Okay. Free University of Brussels, yeah. Okay. Smile for the camera. Well done, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Last but not least, you've got them. Sean's got them. Okay, so the last um, category of excellence awards are the undergraduate awards. Uh, you know that we uh, welcome all sorts of tertiary um, higher learning institutions, vocational colleges, undergraduates, graduates, even professionals, right? We have police leaders, et cetera. So again, for undergraduate teams, you know, competing side by side along PhDs and others is remarkable. And so we did want to recognize some of the outstanding contributions from teams comprised predominantly of undergraduates. And there are three um, awardees today. John? All right, first sure. up, we have the American <laughs> University in Cairo. We have Tecnologico de Monterrey. And Utah Valley University. Technological. Uh -huh. Congratulations. Well done. Congratulations. Yeah, come on over here. Congratulations. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're, it's a dance. It's a dance. There we are. All right, smile for the camera. Amazing. Well done, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say something quickly? Huh? Can I just say something quickly? Of course you may. I just want to, is this on? It's like weeks. <laughs> I just want to say we have a certificate for all the teams Actually, like a lot that have participated, of which we're going to present after we announce the winners. And once we've announced all the winners, close the event, there'll be an opportunity for you to come on stage and have a photo as well. So we want all the teams to have a chance to come up here, but we're going to announce the winners first. Yeah. So certificates for all the semi-finalists, etc. So stick around, lots of photo ops and certificates. Okay, well listen, that was fun. Thanks everybody. Have a good... Um, Shall we move on? So we have four awards to present. Would it be all right if each of you announced one? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Okay. Fantastic. So we're going to start with the audience award, and then we have a third prize, second prize, and the first prize um, to be awarded by the judges that worked so hard. So we'll begin with the audience choice award. Mic check. Yeah. <laughs> North Dakota State University. Congratulations. You're stuck with me. Over. Towards the little banner, I think. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. There we go. Wait for it. It'll be worth it, I promise. Brilliant work, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, Go ahead and announce oh, the third, third prize. Yeah, All get right. in there. Number three for this year's Map the System, we've got Grinnell College. <laughs> That's great. <joking. laughs> They're coming. Oh, they should be here. Yeah. She's representing the team. Congratulations. I didn't know you were here. Yeah, congratulations. Well done, Grinnell. We love you. Thank you. And Tanya to announce the runner-up, second prize. The second prize for uh, Map the System is North Dakota State Ooh. University. <laughs> A 
Another one, I know. We just live here. Uh huh. Get tired of walking up and down. Thank you. Congratulations. Dramatic pause from the center. Okay, everyone. Can I please have a massive drum roll from everybody, please? Okay, wonderful. So first place for Map the System 2022 is the University of Cape Town. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, all the way down. Thank you. So at least someone's paying attention around here. Oh, all the applause. You guys want to say something? No? Okay. Um, so I've been nominated to speak, even though I wasn't uh, on the stage. Uh, <laughs> but as the educator from the University of Cape Town and somebody who's been part of this competition since 2017 when I was a participant, it's been the most incredible experience, and I'm so proud of this team. Um, on Tuesday afternoon, with our flights being on Wednesday, uh, the team still didn't have visas and were absolutely heartbroken. And to have made it here and all the way up here amongst these incredible teams and these incredible people with these amazing organizers, it has just been the experience of a lifetime. So thank you to the University of Oxford, to the Skoll Center and the Side Business School, and to everyone here. Uh, thank you for everything. <laughs> Judges can sit down, yes. You've done your duty, judges. You've got some cakes. Have some. Wow. Some drama. They're still stunned. You're looking at me like, what just happened? <laughs> oh, this is, I told you we're not the Oscars. We didn't, we didn't hire PwC. We may be a bootstrapped organization, but we get the job done. Congratulations to all of you, um, uh, to the, the, th the three runners up. Um, we have certificates for you as well, so we'll have you down for photos in just a moment. Before we close uh, the, the formal um, events today and our Map the System Global Final Weekend, um, two things. First is, as we've already heard now a number of times, uh, in many ways, all the work that you've done that we're celebrating today, for a lot of you, is going to be a first step. Um, some of you are going to go on to other amazing things, and hopefully you'll see the world in a new way and use all these skills to make change. A lot of you are really excited, rightly, about what you've done and want to find ways to carry this forward. So remember that we're here for you, your educators are here for you, whether that's starting a venture, whether that's making sure you know you all have the responsibility to go back to all the amazing people and organizations that shared their knowledge and expertise with you, to share what you've learned with them, and to try to find sure that your work carries impact, um, you know, what, however long that goes for, we're here for you. And so uh, let's make sure we keep talking about that. You are also now part of the Map the System in Oxford communities, and that is a lifelong thing, and we're going to do a lot more to keep this amazing group together. You've got your WhatsApp group for starters, so don't lose that, um, but a lot more to come. Now, before we close, we need to recognize some uh, extraordinary humans uh, without whom we wouldn't be here today. Roman, do you want to come up? Yeah. 
Oh, you go. Is it on? Yes. Look at that magic. Um, so, um, first of all, I think on behalf of um, the MAP the system this year, I would really like just to recognize the Skoll Center team. This was our first big, big um, event that we've run in the last two years post-COVID. It's also the biggest event that we've run together as a team. So, if I can just ask everybody in the Skoll Center team to stand up so we can acknowledge you and give you an applause. Oh, they actually stand up. Oh, oh, that's nice. Come down. Okay. Um, come down. Come down. Come down. Skull okay. Center team, Lydia, Skull Center team, Sophie. come down, come down. Lydia. Come on, come on. Claire. You know who you are. Shayma, Catalina. Nigeria. Amy. Amy, Tash, come, come. Come, come on, come. Tash, come on. Come on, you guys are helping us. For come you. on. Come, come, and um, uh, yes, you as well. No yes. one would have been let in without. Come on, come yes, on. please. Uh -huh. We're incredible event staff. That's fine. Hello for you, for you. Thank you so Let's much. Let's get a nice picture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Smile. Oops. Slide in a little bit. Yeah. That's it. Two people in this team that have put in absolutely more work and more hours than anybody else, and it's not fair just to give them a chocolate, just like we all got, because we know they've probably done triple the amount of work, um, yes, they know who they are. So, um, a, a big thank you to Alice Luke at the Map the System uh, Project Manager. And to Lydia Dali. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Alice and Lydia are the reason why we all actually made it together in Oxford um, this weekend. So thank you so much. She's it's been incredible. For my <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Just about still safe. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Over to you, Peter. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Hey, listen. Thank you. What an awesome weekend it's been. I don't want it to end. Do you have to go? You could stay. I'm afraid as soon as you all leave, it's going to start raining and get cold again. Because um, whatever happened, you brought the sunshine um, this weekend. Listen, thank you all so much for all that you do. Thanks to everyone who's watching online. Congratulations to all the Map the Pr System participants around the world who are with us today. Um, take a deep breath, um, breathe in and feel great about all that you've accomplished. And then tomorrow, get back to work. Um, and uh, spread the word. Uh, hopefully many of you will be mentors next year, and uh, we're looking forward to continuing the journey together. Be safe, travel well, and hang around for photos. Thanks, everyone. Hello. Hello. Oh, University of Chicago to come stage, photo. The runner-up teams. University.